Thank you very much. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your time zone. We are pretty happy to have you with us today uh, on the second leg of our series of webinars on uh, economic diversification in Central Africa, actually building skills for economic diversification in Central Africa. During our first webinar sometime in May, we set the scene and uh, on this second webinar, what we're doing is that we want to actually build bridges. So the theme for this second webinar is leveraging experiences from successful competitors and uh, building partnerships. So uh, uh, we have a, a very interesting panel uh, today. Uh, we would have um, uh, the director for the sub-regional office of Central Africa of ECA, that's the Economic Commission for Africa, give us a word. Uh, thereafter, we will have a presentation from my colleague, uh, Mr. Jean-Luc Mastaki, uh, who is the head of the Economic Diversification Policy and Reform Section at the Economic Commission for Africa's Regional Office for Central Africa. Uh, uh, and then we will have uh, uh, a, a section of presentation from our, our um, August guest and I am So, uh, as part of our August guest, we have uh, uh, Mr. Nabi Jaidi, um, economist. There's a lot of background noise happening. If you're not speaking, please Okay, so thank you. Like I was saying that we have um, a boss guest who will be giving us experiences uh, from uh, their countries or countries where they are based. Uh, so we have uh, Mr. Larabi uh, Jaidi. He's an economist um, and a member of the Policy Center for the New South in Rabat, that's in Morocco. Uh, then we'll have uh, Dr. Nabeyelou Jesses Zelel, is uh, an industrial and chemical engineer and a researcher a uh, university done from ethiopia uh, thereafter we will have a presentation of professor shoko yamada who is a researcher uh, university uh, lecturer at the graduate school of international development at nagoya university that's in japan and then we will have a presentation by uh, Mr. Saliem Paki, he is the executive director for the African Climate Foundation in South Africa. Uh, donc, uh, ça, c'était uh, juste un line-up de présentateurs pour aujourd'hui. On commencera avec uh, le directeur pour le bureau sous-régional uh, pour l'Afrique centrale de la CEA, Commission économique des Nations Unies pour l'Afrique, qui va nous planter un petit décor. Bonjour, Monsieur le directeur Antonio Pedro, le microphone est à vous. Et veuillez uh, mettre en marche votre caméra. Okay, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Abel, and uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, good morning, everyone uh, across the globe. Uh, as uh, Abel indicated, uh, this is a, a continuation of the debate uh, that we had uh, in the first webinar. And I'm very uh, thankful to all the panelists uh, that uh, made themselves available to share with us uh, experiences. It's peer learning, learning by, by, by doing is part of uh, what our countries uh, need to do with a view to addressing this very uh, serious challenge of uh, uh, providing and deploying skills and competences that can respond to the challenges of economic diversification in, in the region. Uh, as we said in our uh, first webinar, uh, even uh, for countries uh, that are much richer than, 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 than our region, uh, we haven't yet seen um, clear decoupling uh, from their dependence on, uh, on, on um, natural resources. Uh, even the countries in the Gulf states, 
they are still locked in the so-called middle income trap because they haven't uh, made the necessary investments in their innovation, science, and technology and skills with a view to building other forms of capital that outlast the currency of the natural capital base. So that's the essence of our conversation. And I think last time also we did say that um, there are models there out there in which this can be done um, in a, um, uh, let's say, a smart way uh, with through partnerships with private sector, special um, multinational corporations, um, because they also have interest in uh, securing those high quality skills and competences. I think we had also spoken of um, the National Suppliers Development Program as one way uh, for us to be able to, through legal and regulatory frameworks, performance requirements, and other tools to get uh, these resources um, available. Because if we don't do that, then we will be uh, locked in this vicious cycle of booms and busts that characterize um, our Central Africa region. So these discussions today uh, will build to our forthcoming um, intergovernmental committee of senior officials and experts, which we would plan to organize now. I mean, the dates are almost set now, 3 to 6 November. Uh, it's going to be a, a virtual meeting because uh, we will not be able to bring uh, the hundreds and so people in one place safely. Um, but uh, I would also like to believe uh, that uh, uh, the discussions today will be a very good input to the effort that uh, the Economic Community of Central African States, ECAS, uh, is also um, uh, pursuing to promote uh, industrialization, economic diversification, and the same applies to SEMAC, where the issue of skills have come up quite frontly uh, as one important component for us to be able to deepen our uh, participation in regional and global value chains, and so on and so forth. So without further ado, therefore, let me once again thank you all for the, your time, and thank you the panelists for uh, giving us an opportunity to hear your experiences. So thank you. Over to you, Eva. Thank you very much, Mr. Director, for your introductory words. I am going to move over now straight to um, my colleague, um, Jean-Luc Mastaki. Jean-Luc will be presenting on Le Grand Bond dans l'industrialisation et la diversification économique. Leçons sur le renforcement des compétences tirées d'Afrique et d'ailleurs. So, Jean-Luc, uh, over to you uh, to recap lessons on uh, diversification, on skills for economic diversification, uh, diversification from elsewhere. The mic. Uh, merci, 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 Abel. Uh, J'espère que uh, la présentation est déjà ouverte, uh, Michel. La présentation, j'attends donc que la présentation soit partagée. Oui, dans un petit instant. Je vois ça sur, euh, sur mon écran. Voilà. Est-ce que c'est la même chose pour tout le monde? Vous pouvez confirmer quelques-uns, s'il vous plaît. You can confirm if you are seeing this presentation or not. Michel, Michel va au début de la présentation. Tu es au slide 5. Là, au ouais. début. Oui, nous voyons la présentation. Ok, merci beaucoup. Oui, bonjour à tous. Moi aussi, je vois la présentation. D'accord. Elle, 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 elle est au premier slide Moi, je suis désolé, mais je ne vois pas de présentation. Bon, une minute, je, je vais remettre ça au premier slide. Ok. Mais alors la présentation. Euh, bonjour, bonjour, euh, chers euh, collègues et participants à la réunion. 
Je suis donc Jean-Luc Mastaki, économiste à la commission ici, et ma présentation ce matin va porter sur le thème « Bâtir les compétences pour la diversification économique en Afrique centrale, tirer parti des expériences d'ailleurs ». Je crois que c'est bon déjà. Très bien, merci Michel. Nous passons donc au, au, au slide suivant. Il s'agira essentiellement de, de passer en revue les problèmes que connaît la sous-région en termes de développement des compétences, mais aussi essayer de voir comment d'autres régions en Afrique et dans le monde ont euh, élaboré des stratégies ou défini des actions pour pouvoir y faire face. Il, il, il n'est plus un secret pour personne que l'industrialisation et la diversification économique sont revenues au top de l'agenda de développement dans la sous-région avec les efforts des, des différentes institutions de, de, de la CEA, mais aussi des communautés économiques régionales. Les, cette, cette industrialisation et la diversification économique que nous souhaitons ont des forts liens avec la, le développement des ressources humaines. Et nous parlons de plus en plus de l'économie des savoirs, des connaissances et des talents, où les compétences sont au cœur de tout processus de, 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 de croissance inclusive et lorsqu'ils sont accompagnés par un marché de travail dynamique. Notre sous-région, avec sa population jeune, avec ses atouts démographiques, a des opportunités à saisir pour tirer profit des nouvelles opportunités qu'offrent les, industri les, les industries du futur, mais elle aussi renforcer sa productivité et la compétitivité, plutôt et la diversification de cette économie. Mais la réalité est que lorsqu'on regarde un certain nombre d'indices, on se rend compte que notre sous-région n'a pas tiré profit de ce potentiel humain, il n'a pas beaucoup développé son capital humain. Il faut donc urgentement équiper le plus grand nombre d'entre nous avec le savoir et les compétences, ainsi que des opportunités pour propulser l'industrialisation et la diversification économique. On peut passer au slide suivant. Lorsqu'on regarde l'indice de développement du capital humain par région en 2017, on se rend compte que l'Afrique et donc notre sous-région aussi présente le plus grand gap, le plus grand déficit en termes de, de développement du capital humain. Le développement du capital humain est défini ici comme la mobilisation des talents et des compétences qui permet à une communauté, à une région, de pouvoir apporter de la valeur dans l'économie globale. On peut passer au slide suivant. En jetant un regard beaucoup plus minutieux sur cet indice de compétitivité qui, qui est produit par le World Economic Forum, on se rend compte que l'Afrique centrale est parmi les, les sous-régions les moins loties, même au niveau africain. Seuls quatre pays de, de la sous-région figurent parmi les 150 pays les plus compétitifs d'après cet indice. Aucun de nos pays ne figure parmi les 110 pays, premiers pays. Les pays africains les plus compétitifs se trouvant en, en Afrique australe, dans la zone SADEC, essentiellement l'Afrique du Sud de l'île Maurice, ou en Afrique du Nord. Les pays les plus performants en termes de compétitivité chez nous reste le Gabon et le Cameroun, et il ne se retrouve qu'au qu 119 et 123e place de ces classements. Ça montre donc les retards et les difficultés que nous avons en termes de compétitivité. Évidemment, on peut se consoler en disant aucun pays africain ne figure parmi les 50 pays les plus compétitifs au monde, mais nous, notre retard en tant que sous-région est vraiment criant. Ces faibles productivités et cette faible compétitivité sont justifiées entre autres par un développement inadéquat des compétences qui plombe la compétitivité et la diversification économique au niveau de nos, de, de nos pays. Le slide suivant. Lorsqu'on regarde la part, les parts des pays africains dans les top 140 de l'indice global de compétitivité par tranche de rang, on se rend compte que effectivement, euh, les pays de l'Afrique, l'Afrique centrale, comme je l'ai dit, ne sont qu'à partir, ne sont placés qu'à partir de 101 et continuer. Il n'y en a pas qui soit dans les tops, comme je l'ai dit. On peut passer, on a déjà dit ça. Alors, quelles sont les caractéristiques d'un système efficient de développement des compétences Quel système devons-nous mettre en place pour pouvoir développer les compétences dans la sous-région afin de faire face, face aux défis dont nous parlons Un bon système de développement des compétences, tel que défini par l'OCDE, est un système qui est réactif. C'est-à-dire, il assure que l'offre de compétences est capable de s'adapter à l'évolution de la demande. La demande, c'est l'industrie. La demande, c'est les entreprises, c'est le secteur privé, le secteur public, les employeurs. Il va falloir que nos institutions de formation, les, les systèmes de production de savoir, les systèmes d'innovation s'adaptent à cette demande-là. Première qualité. Deuxième qualité, c'est l'efficience de l'offre. 
qui assure que les compétences qu'on a acquis, qu'on a acquis, les sont au bon moment et au bon endroit et de manière les plus, les plus efficace. Alors que la flexibilité de l'offre euh, des compétences signifie que chacun qui a acquis des compétences peut se former, quelle que soit la, la, la matière, les moments et les modalités choisies. La flexibilité elle signifie aussi l'inclusivité de ce système qui doit donner la chance à tout le monde, sans distinction de sexe, d'âge et de race, de pouvoir accès, avoir accès aux, aux formations. La transférabilité des compétences. La transférabilité des compétences est, est, est une dimension très importante dans cette situation de libre circulation des de personnes, parce qu'elle permet à ce que les compétences accumulées dans le passé puissent être mobilisées dans d'autres régions ou dans d'autres secteurs et être reconnues comme telles par le système d'évaluation. Et la facilité d'accès définit l'élimination des barrières à l'entrée comme les frais initiaux et d'autres restrictions d'âge, de situations géographiques qui font que finalement certaines personnes sont exclues du système de formation. Alors que euh, la, 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 un bon système de, de développement des compétences est aussi caractérisé par la diminution du coût de perfectionnement en proposant des formations euh, qui sont modulées et dont l'accès est facile. Les coûts de formation doivent être accessibles. Euh, slide suivant, Michel. Une bonne stratégie de développement des, co des compétences ainsi définie permettra de développer la capacité d'une société à s'adapter aux exigences des emplois du futur. Les emplois du futur, ici, c'est la révolution 4.0, les emplois du futur, c'est les emplois verts, et ainsi de suite. Nous devons être en mesure d'avoir un système qui permet à la majorité de se projeter vers ces emplois-là et ce système performant est mesuré non seulement par l'efficacité du système d'éducation lui-même, mais par la disponibilité des compétences et le déploiement des ressources humaines en général. Un tel système est bâti sur un accès étendu à l'éducation en prime enfance. Il s'agit de l'éducation tout au long du cycle de vie, l'apprentissage tout au long du cycle de vie, et qui commence par l'éducation à la base, l'éducation primaire et secondaire. S'assurer que le caractère futuriste est assuré et est couvert dans les curriculums et les programmes de formation. Il faut qu'il soit tourné vers le futur. Il faut investir dans le développement et la maintenance d'un pool de formateurs professionnels. Il faut que les formateurs, les enseignants soient outillés pour faire face aux enjeux de, 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 du système économique lui-même. Une exploitation un peu plus fort à la place du travail, une, une exposition un peu plus tôt à la place du travail, il faut que les gens, les jeunes surtout, aient la possibilité d'être exposés à l'expérience du travail dans leur cursus de, de formation. Il faut investir dans les capacités numériques et les, 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 les nouvelles technologies, l'information et la communication. Nous sommes à l'ère du numérique et la révolution digitale. Il faut que notre système de, de, de développement de compétences porte ces dimensions-là. Il faut créer une culture d'apprentissage tout au long de la vie, je l'ai dit. Et essentiellement, ça, ce sont des critères qui permettent finalement d'évaluer est-ce que, est que nous avons un bon système de développement des compétences Slide suivant, Michel. Lorsqu'on audite on le, le, le développement des compétences en Afrique centrale, on identifie un certain nombre de défis à la lumière de tous les critères que nous avons épinglés là-dessus. On remarque très rapidement qu'il y a une croissance soutenue des cohortes au niveau de l'éducation primaire, mais lorsqu'on passe du primaire au secondaire, les, 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 les taux bruts de scolarisation deviennent décroissants. Et au, au tertiaire, à l'université, les taux deviennent encore plus décroissants. L'éducation et la formation technique et professionnelle, les fameux TVET, qui devraient récupérer les rejetés du système de l'éducation formelle, ne sont pas à la, à la, à la hauteur de ces ambitions-là. Ils souffrent par leur manque de pertinence, d'efficience, d'attractivité et d'inclusivité. Ils ne sont pas inclusifs parce que la plupart de nos formations professionnelles ne sont pas euh, très forts en termes d'attraction, par exemple, de vie, d'attraction des groupes marginalisés, et ainsi de suite. Ils ne sont pas efficients parce qu'ils sont souvent chers. Le coût d'accès à, à, à ces institutions est très élevé, mais aussi la proximité géographique pose problème pour certaines contrées, la plupart d'entre elles étant localisées dans les grandes villes et surtout dans les grandes capitales. Plus important encore, il se remarque une inadéquation de l'offre d'enseignement aux besoins des marchés du travail. Lorsqu'on regarde seulement l'éducation euh, supérieure, qui porte généralement les capacités en termes de sciences, technologies et recherche, on se rend compte que les filières sont peu professionnalisantes et généralement, les enseignements sont beaucoup plus théoriques. 
il y a beaucoup de faiblesses dans l'attractivité et l'efficacité des, des, des sciences, des filières des sciences, technologies, mathématiques et les ingénieries. Ça pose un problème. Nous sommes dans les formations beaucoup plus théoriques et peu professionnalisantes. Les offres de formation ne sont pas alignées avec l'économie réelle et ils réduisent alors l'engouement des bénéficiaires. Et les, les ménages qui devraient s'adresser à ces institutions perdent la perdent, ne sont pas souvent attirés parce que les formations que nous offrons ne sont pas en adéquation avec l'économie réelle. Les programmes sont rarement actualisés sur base des références des métiers. Il n'y a pas un dialogue entre les institutions de formation et le secteur privé et les métiers. Et les budgets même des ministères, alors que nous avons dans la sous-région ici, les, les, les systèmes de développement des compétences est essentiellement financé par les budgets publics. Ces budgets sont faibles et parfois plus vulnérables. Lorsqu'on regarde les derniers chocs pétroliers qui a, qui a secoué des économies comme le Tchad, le, 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 le congo Brazzaville et, 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 et la, la Guinée équatoriale, on se rend compte que les postes budgétaires les plus affectés, parmi les plus affectés, il y a des postes budgétaires liés à l'éducation et surtout à la formation technique. Next slide, Michel. Mais ces problèmes ne sont pas propres à nous. D'autres zones, d'autres pays, d'autres régions les ont connus et y ont apporté des solutions. Je vais vite passer en revue quelques solutions qui ont été adoptées par un certain nombre de pays en Afrique et dans le monde. La première solution, c'est les zones économiques spéciales que nous sommes en train à la suite de promouvoir comme outils d'industrialisation et de diversification économique et qui sont en train d'être développées dans une nouvelle génération comme des canaux de transmission et de développement des compétences. Il s'agit des classes industrielles qui sont aujourd'hui utilisés dans beaucoup de pays africains et autres pays en développement comme des réseaux d'apprentissage et de développement des compétences pour un meilleur partage et transfert de connaissances. Des partenariats sont innovants sont en train d'être conclus entre ces classes et les institutions de développement des, des, des compétences qui finissent par cimenter les liens qui manquaient entre l'industrie et notre système de, 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 de formation. Il y a une opportunité réelle d'infuser le développement des compétences à côté de l'efficience des infrastructures et du climat des affaires que les États donnent à ces zones économiques spéciales. Il s'agit des espaces où le climat des affaires est amélioré, où les infrastructures physiques, les soft and hard, sont améliorées. Il va falloir qu'on infuse beaucoup plus de façon beaucoup plus volontariste les rôles et les compétences dans ce système-là. Ils peuvent offrir des opportunités de formation tout au long du cycle de la vie. Lorsqu'on analyse euh, l'offre, la demande des compétences dans les industries, la plupart d'entre elles peuvent être couvertes par des, petits, des, des formations sur les lieux du travail. Et les zones économiques, des, des, des zones économiques spéciales peuvent offrir cet avantage. L'engagement ferme des, des, des zones économiques spéciales sous ces chantiers permettra aussi de renforcer l'éducation dans les zones où ils sont, ils sont installés. L'éducation des groupes marginalisés, des populations riveraines peut être portée par ces zones et consacrer ainsi l'apprentissage tout au long du cycle de vie du personnel et ainsi que l'alignement des écoles de formation technique et professionnelle sur les stratégies de développement. Dans notre sous-région, ces zones économiques spéciales sont généralement des caractéristiques très nationales. On n'a pas encore des zones économiques spéciales transfrontalières comme on peut en trouver dans la zone SADEC, où il y en a entre l'Afrique du Sud et le Zimbabwe, ainsi de suite, ou en Afrique de l'Est, entre la Tanzanie, le Kenya, et ainsi de suite. Il y a moyen de penser à renforcer cette animation coopération sous-régionale dans le développement des saisons économiques spéciales et impulser ainsi le développement des compétences au niveau sous-régional. Mais quelles sont les tendances au niveau des pays africains Comme je l'ai dit, les zones économiques spéciales sont une, un, un arrangement institutionnel en vogue maintenant. On peut voir comment la dynamique est croissante au niveau global, mais aussi au niveau de l'Afrique. Certains pays africains tirent déjà certains avantages de ces zones économiques spéciales en tant que véhicules de transfert des de, 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 de connaissances, d'innovation et aussi de développement des compétences et des capacités des travailleurs. C'est essentiellement les grands pays comme le Nigeria, le Kenya et l'Égypte. Dans notre sous-région, on a encore euh, du retard. Le Cameroun est parmi les, top, euh, les premiers pays qui, font, euh, qui ont déjà fait un pas dans ce sens-là. Mais il y a beaucoup de zones économiques spéciales dans les pipelines au niveau des pays. Comme nous sommes encore au niveau... Euh, au niveau euh, au early, au niveau très tôt de développement, c'est le moment d'infuser la dimension développement des compétences dans les lois et les législations qui portent ces zones économiques spéciales. 
les États doivent le faire, mais aussi des partenariats publics et privés pour pouvoir renforcer cette dimension doivent être encouragés. Next slide. Deuxième euh, innovation et réponse que beaucoup de pays, surtout les pays européens, sont en train de mettre en œuvre, c'est l'adéquation des de, de formations aux besoins de l'industrie à travers des partenariats innovants entre les, 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 les écoles de formation professionnelle et l'industrie. Ceci concerne la Norvège, la Suisse, l'Allemagne, la Turquie. Des partenariats publics et privés qui renforcent l'efficience et la pertinence de ces écoles techniques et de formation technique, les TV, sont en train d'être développés et promouvoir les compétences industrielles en Europe. J'ai retenu deux ou trois exemples, il y en a beaucoup. Le Learning Factory situé à Rofos Industrial Park en Norvège, par exemple, permet aux étudiants en ingénierie et mécanique, mécanique et génie industriel de pouvoir combiner leur formation technique dans la salle de classe avec des activités au sein de l'industrie. Ça permet à ces jeunes-là d'avoir accès aux technologies appliquées déjà par l'industrie et de pouvoir se placer dans l'orbite des emplois du futur et être en mesure de renforcer leur employabilité immédiatement à la sortie de l'école de formation. Le même le Learning Factory offre de nouvelles technologies aux élèves de, 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 de cet évêque-là et leur permet de, de, de se frotter au progrès technologique qui est généralement l'apanage de l'industrie, étant donné que la plupart des écoles techniques, ici comme là-bas, accusent un retard par rapport à l'industrie. Un autre partenariat intéressant était le partenariat entre les, les écoles techniques, les, les formations techniques et, et professionnelles et les PME sur le développement des innovations numériques. Ces institutions de formation parviennent alors en envoyant leurs, leurs, leurs élèves dans les PME, de ceux qui créent les logiciels, de ceux qui créent les, 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 les porteurs des innovations en matière du numérique, à pouvoir se frotter aux, 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 aux emplois du futur et aux exigences du secteur. Ceci est fait en partenariat avec l'Université métropolitaine d'Oslo. Les institutions de formation technique ont été ainsi capables de faire face à une contrainte que le nôtre connaisse, c'est-à-dire accéder aux infrastructures du numérique, aux infrastructures modernes et des pointes, sans pouvoir payer pour ces infrastructures étant donné les contraintes financières qu'ils ont. L'Autriche, l'Allemagne et la Norvège ont, ont résolu ces problèmes-là de façon innovante. Il faut, donc chez nous renforcer, il faut donc chez nous renforcer le dialogue et de façon permanente entre l'industrie et les institutions de formation pour qu'un certain nombre de contraintes que rencontrent nos écoles de formation technique et professionnelle soient levées par des solutions de marché. Next slide, euh, Michel. Une autre, une autre euh, dimension de développement des compétences qui a été résolue de façon innovante par un certain nombre de pays et des regroupements économiques, c'est la libre circulation, la portabilité des compétences et l'intégration régionale. L'Allemagne, la France, l'Union européenne, même l'Inde ont été innovants dans ce cadre-là. Il est, il, est, il, est, il, est, il, est, il est clair que les écoles de formation technique et professionnelle permettent aux migrants de pouvoir se former et s'intégrer facilement sur le marché de travail dans les pays d'accueil. Mais la certification des compétences accumulées par les migrants tout au long de leur vie, parce que nous sommes en train de parler du de développement des compétences tout au long du cycle de vie, a été encouragé au sein de l'Union européenne où il y a des mécanismes de certification de ces compétences-là. Et ceci facilite la libre circulation de la main-d'œuvre qualifiée. La reconnaissance internationale des qualifications et compétences acquises et la formation, aussi bien dans les pays d'accueil que celui de départ, aide beaucoup de migrants à contribuer à la croissance et à la diversification économique, non seulement dans les pays d'accueil, la plupart des fois on parle des pays d'accueil, mais ils contribuent aussi dans les pays de départ. On parle de toutes ces problématiques de remittance qui sont en train de financer un certain nombre de petits projets dans le secteur des services et de l'éducation, et donc ils contribuent aussi à la diversification économique dans ce pays-là. Des programmes de formation internationaux tels que Erasmus+, qui permet la, libre, la, la, la circulation et l'échange l'expérience des étudiants en Europe permet de les partager déjà à la portabilité des compétences à travers la compréhension de la dimension culturelle du mouvement de libre circulation euh, des de, de, de facteurs. Un des pays émergents et qui a presque les mêmes problèmes comme nous, c'est l'Inde. Et l'Inde en développement, euh, le ministère de, de, du Développement des Compétences et Entrepreneuriat de l'Inde, qui est déjà une innovation, tout un ministère qui se focalise sur ces questions, à travers son initiative Skill India, a mis en place des centres au niveau des provinces et des États 
pour pouvoir développer les compétences des jeunes indiens candidats à l'immigration, les préparer aussi bien techniquement, mais aussi bien dans les behavior skills, en termes de compréhension de la culture des pays où ils veulent aller, et aussi de, en les préparant en termes de développement des langues et en certifiant leurs leur, leur, leur compétences en relation avec les standards internationaux des pays qui les intéressent. Cette innovation a permis le placement de beaucoup de jeunes Indiens qualifiés à des emplois internationaux et faciliter la portabilité de leurs compétences. La leçon que nous pouvons prendre chez nous, c'est l'urgence d'harmonisation des de, de, de systèmes de formation, mais aussi d'accréditation et de certification des compétences au niveau sous-régional, impliquant les regroupements, les regroupements économiques sous-régionaux pour pouvoir permettre la libre circulation, plutôt la mobilisation et la circulation des mains d'œuvre qualifiées. Ainsi, nous allons retenir, nous allons non seulement créer les compétences, mais aussi les retenir et faire face à la fuite des cerveaux qui caractérise nos pays. Next slide. Un autre euh, élément, élément important sur lequel il va falloir investir s'il faut développer nos systèmes de, notre système de développement des compétences, c'est le système de formation intégrée du marché du travail. La plupart de nos pays dépendent des enquêtes qualitatives pour savoir l'état de la demande et des offres de compétences. Ils n'ont pas un système intégré qui leur permette de façon instantanée de savoir quelle est la situation du marché du travail, quelle est la situation du côté de l'offre comme du côté de la demande. Et il est difficile de répondre aux enjeux du développement des compétences si on ne peut pas appréhender le phénomène lui-même. L'Afrique du Sud a développé un système d'information intégrée du marché du travail qui lui permet à un instant donné de pouvoir avoir une idée sur les besoins urgents en termes de compétences du secteur de l'industrie, mais aussi auditer la qualité et la quantité de ressources humaines qualifiées que son système d'éducation et de formation professionnelle offre au monde du travail. La l'Afrique du Sud, à travers son système sur le marché du travail, produit donc des données de qualité sur l'emploi et les compétences. De telles plateformes vont, vont nous aider à anticiper les nouvelles tendances en termes de compétences et les, les besoins relatifs, mais aussi cibler particulièrement les industries. L'Afrique du Sud cible l'industrie, par exemple, de l'économie verte et du numérique en fonction des informations que son système intégré lui donne. L'Afrique centrale devra renforcer comme leçon la coopération sous-régionale pour le développement et le partage d'informations et surtout l'adoption d'un point de vue régional sur les méthodes de prévision des compétences et les méthodes de suivi et évaluation de l'offre et la demande des compétences dans la sous-région pour pouvoir définir des politiques qui sont basées sur les faits, evidence-based policy. Jean-Luc, can you take Je suis en train de conclure, il reste deux slides. Okay. Next slide. Next slide, Michel. Michel, le, le slide suivant. Voilà. Le slide suivant porte sur des euh, mécanismes intéressants de financement innovant du développement des compétences qui sont mobilisés par un certain nombre de pays parce que la problématique de financement, comme je l'ai dit, est cruciale. Et des pays, parmi, les, parmi nous, les pays africains, le Rwanda, l'Afrique du Sud, ont déjà fait un pas dans ce sens. L'Argentine, le Brésil, ainsi que d'autres, tels que la Turquie, ont adopté des mécanismes innovants de financement des compétences, incluant les crédits formation qui offrent une seconde chance aux individus de pouvoir de, 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 de qualification de se former, l'État assurant ainsi un financement suffisant et stable au développement des compétences. Des États, beaucoup d'États ont se sont engagés vers la diversification des sources de financement avec forte participation du secteur privé. C'est la Turquie, c'est l'Afrique la, du Sud, c'est l'Argentine. Des initiatives de création des fonds de financement de la formation alimentés par une fiscalité volontariste et stimulée ont été lancées ça et là, notamment en Asie, en Asie du Sud, la Malaisie et le Singapour. au lieu des taxes allouées aux fonds spécialisés pour faciliter le développement des compétences. Alors que le Rwanda met en place une fiscalité qui permet de collecter des, 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 des impôts destinés essentiellement au développement des compétences. De telles initiatives doivent impliquer les entreprises dans leur développement, de l'élaboration à la gouvernance des fonds, mais aussi la fiscalité devrait beaucoup plus cibler les entreprises qui ont beaucoup plus de, 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 de besoins de, 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 de développement des compétences afin que les, les, mécanismes, les, les marchés lui-même aident à financer le développement des compétences. 
Il faut aussi appuyer les PME. Les PME ont un besoin énorme de financement, de, de développement de compétences, mais n'ont pas de financement. Il faut bien penser à eux, mais aussi penser au secteur informel qui, à travers la pratique d'apprentissage chez nous, continue à cristalliser beaucoup de jeunes qui sont en train d'être formés. Les, une autre euh, innovation, c'est le renforcement du rôle de la PME dans euh, le système de développement des compétences à travers ce que le directeur a si bien dit au, dé, au début, le les développement du contenu local et des pays avant-gardistes en Afrique, c'est le Ghana. L'Union africaine elle-même, à travers la vision africaine des mines, a défini les modalités du développement du contenu local qui permet en sorte que les zones économiques spéciales, mais aussi les grands investissements directs étrangers qui viennent chez nous puissent pouvoir bénéficier aux petites et moyennes entreprises en termes de transfert de compétences, en termes de transfert de technologies, mais aussi de spillover, de l'effet spillover des connaissances et des innovations. Les, 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 les politiques de contenu local ne seront efficaces que lorsqu'ils sont intégrés dans une approche holistique de développement des PME. Là où ces politiques existent, mais il n'y a pas, par exemple, les politiques de, de, de renforcement des capacités, d'accès au financement, ainsi de suite, de la PME, ils n'ont pas donné beaucoup de succès. Il va falloir qu'on y réfléchisse. La participation du secteur privé dans le développement des de, de compétences en Turquie, je l'ai déjà dit, le, 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 le modèle turc est assis sur la mobilisation de la tripartite, tripartite entreprise, État, syndicat, dans la définition des compétences, mais aussi dans la mise en œuvre des systèmes de formation. L'industrie finance donc une mosaïque d'initiatives de développement des compétences en appui à l'inclusion des jeunes et des femmes sur le marché du travail en partenariat avec les syndicats et l'État. Il faut renforcer les dialogues publics et privés au long du processus. D'autres innovations dont je, pas, je, ne, je ne vais pas parler ici, c'est le Kaizen, le modèle qui sera présenté par euh, des collègues, mais aussi les, les verdissements où je sais que nous avons un, un bon expert qui a l'expérience de, de, de l'Éthiopie qui pourra partager avec nous, mais aussi des incubateurs et innovations pour pouvoir transmettre les savoirs aux jeunes. En conclusion, les leçons transversales que nous pouvons tirer de toutes ces expériences d'ailleurs, il, il y a un besoin urgent d'une forte collaboration entre l'industrie et l'État. Pourquoi cette collaboration Parce qu'il existe ce que les économistes appellent les échecs de marché et des asymétries d'informations liées au développement du modèle des compétences. La plupart d'employeurs ne sont pas incités à payer pour le développement des compétences étant donné la transférabilité des compétences. Euh, une ressource formée ayant beaucoup plus de propension à aller vers un autre secteur, ainsi de suite. Il faut donc que l'État intervienne, qu'il y ait une collaboration et un partenariat pour pouvoir inciter les acteurs privés dans les zones économiques spéciales et ailleurs à investir dans le les développement des compétences. Il y a Jean-Luc, Jean Jean I'm really sorry, I'll, I'll have to uh, intervene here. Um, you are on a very wonderful promenade. I call it the fire on the wall promenade. And um, uh, even without concluding, I think we have really got a, a lot of points. So uh, I thank you very much for that. Uh, just to uh, quickly summarize what Jean-Luc has said in English, for our participants who are Anglophones, um, especially presenters for uh, our ease of interaction. Uh, jean Lu actually took a tour of the world to see, see from here and there experiences that could be very interesting to Central Africa. And one of uh, the thematics he covered, which I found very important, uh, is um, about uh, what ecosystem do we need? What ecosystem do we need for uh skills that are fit for purpose for economic diversification in central africa so he said that we needed the first thing we needed a, a complete ecosystem of synergy uh between the private sector the public sector the industry uh employers and other players and the second point was we need skills supply efficiency the third point we need flexibility of actors the fourth point we need transferability of of skills, a system of transferability of skills. And then he moved on to what kind of innovations do we need in order to bring up to speed, you know, skills that we need for diversification in Central Africa. And I just picked a few points there that are of, of, of interest. Uh, the first, he said, uh, we need to uh, go down the road of special economic zones. Unfortunately, we do not have many of them in Central Africa. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, which seems to be faring very well, is the 
Economic Zone and COP in uh, Libreville, uh, Gabon. Uh, so I think that uh, other countries might be taking caps from there. Uh, but he acknowledged the fact that uh, we have nascent economic zones uh, in the sub-region, which are trying to develop uh, industrial clusters. The second point was um, to match training with the needs of industry. And then he talked about, he put his finger especially on the learning factory in Norway, where, you know, students actually can go to industrial outfits and, you know, put their skills to use. So that by the time they leave school, they already know what the industry needs and they're coming from school uh, exactly with that kind of package. And the third thing he said was the free movement of skills within uh, a certain sub-region. He gave the example of movement between Germany and France and the whole of EU and then India, uh, regions within India. So he talked about uh, a fourth point, which was uh, the need for an integrated information system on you know, the, 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 the job market. And he pinpointed the South African situation uh, that it is something to copy. Uh, then he talked about the need to create local content strategies for SMEs. Uh, 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 he gave examples of, of Ghana and uh, what we have next door in the DRC, which is uh, 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 something really good for us to look at. Uh, then he also talked about the need for the entrenchment uh, of the private sector in training itself. And I think that uh, uh, for, for this kind of uh, role, or uh, for this kind of um, um, uh, this kind of, of recommendation we will need uh, like our enterprise upgrading uh, offices. We have one in Cameroon uh, to work uh, in very close collaboration with the private sector in order to help build skills from our young people who want skills so that uh, they come out and they produce what is needed for our uh, economic diversification and industrialization. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. Uh, his presentation will be shared. Um, Michelle, if you have a way, please, you can put it in the chat box so that um, people can download it. Uh, so we have we are moving now from uh, that sort of fly uh, on the wall promenade uh, into specific examples. So here I'm calling on our first speaker, who is from Morocco. He's going to be speaking to the issue of uh, that country's agricultural, manufacturing, and services sector, uh, where they've come to, they've come a long way, and skills building has been very important in that. So how did they do it? Uh, what specific examples uh, can we take home uh, in order to, uh, you know, um, make uh, economic diversification move in Central Africa? Donc, je fais appel à Monsieur Larabi Aidi, du Policy Center for the New South uh, Ahaba. Il va nous parler de la situation au Maroc uh, en termes de son écosystème agricole, manufacturier et service. Qu'est-ce qu'ils ont pu faire? Comment uh, ils ont pu arriver là où ils sont? Uh, la, parole, la parole est à vous, Monsieur Zaidi. Merci. Monsieur Jaïdi, êtes-vous en ligne? Vous êtes en ligne? Michel, uh, I, 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 am, I am in as a participant because of system issues. I don't know, you can check, can you check uh, at your end if uh, Mr. Larabi uh, Jaïdi is on the line? I'm sure his initial should be L, 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 J. Mm. Okay, let me. Uh, I just uh, uh, share the John Luke presentation. Eh? If anybody wants to download, uh, we, you can download. All right, that's superb. Uh, so uh, it would appear that uh, we we do not have uh, Mr. Larabi Zaidi on the line. I hope he will come up at some point of the conversation. It would have been very interesting to get uh, experiences from Morocco. Uh, but now let me. Uh, move to uh, Ethiopia. 
uh, to meet uh, Dr. Mabielu uh, Delele, who will talk to us about, um, you know, the export substitution uh, experience of Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia has done very well, or is doing very well in that uh, domain. And uh, what, is it, what, what is it that they need that we need to copy from? Over. Uh, wow. Je, je, ouais, j'apprête sa présentation à Ben. Une minute. Yes. So, uh, 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 Nabi, um, just yeah. uh, for why, why Michel uh, loads your bike? I think yeah. it's already. I think it is this one because he he has three present. He has three PowerPoint. Correct. Yes. Uh, correct. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, on three uh, areas. The first one is uh, import substitution to leverage agri, agri business, and the second one is laser production, and the third one is aviation surface. All right. So let, what I suggest to you, uh, what I suggest to you, Doc, is, is that please uh, try and take about 15 minutes to do this. I know that uh, it is very dense, uh, but try and take about 15 minutes to do this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, this one is... Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Michel, can you, can you bring the first, the leather production? This one? The leather production. There are three uh, presentations. The first, okay, okay. Yeah, I would, I would like to start with leather production. So just to indicate to participants that um, uh, Dr. Zelele of uh, Ethiopia, who is uh, a an industrial and chemical engineer researcher, University of Toronto, has a couple of presentations, but he wants to segment them to speak to specific issues uh, so that uh, they are uh, quite understandable. Uh, are we there, Michel? Yes, I think I think we're there. Yeah. Je sais, oh, je l'ai anglais. Euh, enlevez votre euh, caméra, s'il vous plaît. OK. Uh, can I, uh, should I start now? Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, but Michel, can you make it uh, uh, full screen, if possible? If not, we can... Yes, thank you. Okay, if not, we can, we can, uh, I can go ahead with it, no problem. Uh, okay, uh, the, when we are talking about uh, laser production, I think we start from uh, animal husbandry and uh, we end at the uh, laser goods. Uh, next, next slide, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, uh, Ethiopia is one of uh, the countries that has a large number of uh, uh, livestock population. And uh, we have the next next slide. Hello, Michelle. Yes. I'm getting you. It, it will take some second for you to okay. realize that we have changed. Okay, okay. Is it that one? Yeah, this, this is the correct one, yes. Uh, two things, one, can you make it full screen? It's full screen now. Uh, I, I don't yes. see that one. Yes. No, it's not Michelle. It might yes. take a little. It might take a little time to show on our head. So maybe we just give it a few seconds. We'll probably take a few minutes. Uh, sorry, a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Uh Well, in the meantime, uh, let me talk about the basic. 
uh, points which I am going to uh, talk uh, in the area of uh, leather production. As I said, uh, we start from animal husbandry and uh, from the animal husbandry, raw hide and skin is the uh, second stage where we get, we get as a byproduct from the uh, livestock while the main purpose of having livestock in Ethiopia or in any other countries as well is for the production of meat. Uh, therefore, the byproduct leather uh, is the uh, raw hide and the skin is processed uh, to uh, get the final product uh, leather. But from animal husbandry, the next, the second stage uh, would be the uh, production of uh, the raw hide and the skin, which brings us to the uh, uh, slaughtering. Uh, practice as a slaughtering as a slaughtering uh, uh, at the abattoir uh, there are uh, there going to be a, a production of uh, raw and hide skin where there are several ways of producing raw and hide uh, skin uh, in Ethiopia uh, the as you know the highest number of uh, uh, animal uh, or livestock uh, is owned by a small uh, Holder farmers and a very small amount is owned by the commercial farms. Uh, therefore, there is a problem of having a better quality or a good quality of raw hide and skin uh, unless uh, a proper uh, intervention uh, would be taken in order to make it uh, more uh, quality uh, as an input to the uh, tanneries. Uh, Misha, could you really go uh, manage it? Hello, Misha. Yes, I did. I did it. Mm. Uh. Oh, that's not good. Okay, bye. -bye. No, but this is a. Well, if you buy a secret, I can't go to the house. I can't go to the house. I can't go to the house. Mr. Tuka, votre microphone est ouvert, s'il vous plaît. On aurait même pu faire ça samedi. Mr. Tuka, votre microphone est ouvert, s'il vous plaît. Michel, Michel, mot de présentation, s'il te plaît. C'est déjà un mot de présentation. Uh, Michel, yeah. Just go to the slide number that he needs because it's, we are not seeing the slide. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just, the slide number he needs. yeah, just go to the uh, third slide. Can you make it? Can you jump to the third slide? This one? The third, yeah, but a slide yeah, number three. Yeah. I think he can't move it. Yeah. Michel. Wow. Okay. Uh, 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 Don, PowerPoint? I think you should Pour continue us. to share the PowerPoint, like, as the director said. This is this one, right? Yeah, the, it's yes. the correct. Yeah, it's the correct one, but. Mais il faut le relancer parce que comme comme était maintenant il te bloqué dans le premier seulement dans le titre. All right, so why, why Michel is uh, so, sort of restarting uh, PowerPoint or to reshare the screen, uh, I think, uh, uh, Nabi, you can just continue with your discourse and we can yeah. start with uh, sharing the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, as I said, yeah, we start from the uh, animal husbandry and we uh, go through the value chain until the end where uh, we get to the end uh, leather product. At the animal husbandry stage, there are some uh, challenges that affects uh, the uh, production of raw hide and skin, which is the major input to the tanneries, where the tanneries process and produce the end uh, or the finished uh, uh, leather. Uh, at the stage of uh, animal husbandry, there are four major challenges. 
uh, which have a direct impact on rawhide and the skin. Uh, the first one is, of course, the uh, system of raising livestock. Uh, yeah, as I said, 99.3% of the uh, animal uh, owned by smallholder farmers uh, where who cannot really afford to uh, properly uh, uh, take care of their animals uh, for the production of uh, uh, raw uh, hide and skin. And instead, they are preparing their animal for meat. And uh, in this case, uh, hide and skin is a byproduct. Therefore, they do not give a serious attention for the hide and skin. Uh, therefore, proper assistance is required to the smallholder farmers in order to have a proper uh, animal husbandry so that uh, tanneries could get a better quality uh, raw hide and skin. Uh, there, are the, the, there are some other uh, challenges that affect the uh, animals uh, which has a direct impact on the uh, raw hide and skin and uh, uh, disease prevalence and management. Uh, particularly uh, the parasite infection, uh, especially he hectoparasites are affecting the highland uh, ships, which is the best quality of skin for the production of uh, glove. Now, uh, another point which needs to be uh, seen in the production of raw hide and skin uh, to have a better quality for the supply to the tanneries is the uh, slaughtering practice. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, the, there are domestic abattoir and export abattoir, meaning that abattoir that gives service uh, for slaughter, slaughtering the animals. Uh, domestic one is those animals that are pro that are consumed locally and exports, but is meat production for export. And these two abattoirs, the production of uh, hide and skin is in a better form than uh, that of the uh, animals slaughtered at the backyard or rural uh, slaughter slab. Uh, therefore, the majority of uh, the animals slaughtered at the backyard, which people do not give serious attention for the uh, skin or height, and which normally is supposed to be uh, uh, well uh, followed by, uh, by, uh, by the government as in order to have a better quality of uh, raw height and skin for the tanneries. Now, the first stage is really keeping the animals in a proper way. And the second stage is having a better uh, slaughtering uh, practice in order to get a better quality rawhide and skin. Then once we do have uh, rawhide and skin, the next step is going to be then uh, the tanneries. At this stage, uh, there are about 33 registered uh, uh, tanneries in Ethiopia, which 24 are currently operational. Uh, yeah, out of this, there are about uh, about 14 uh, foreign uh, direct uh, foreign direct investment and about uh, about 20 uh, uh, about 20. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Huh? Yeah, uh, I am on the go. next. Yeah, uh, next one. I've already said some words. About. Yeah, uh, just to say some words about uh, the uh, steps involved in the threading of raw hide and skin. As I said, the production is the product that is after the slaughtering uh, practice. At this production stage, uh, proper uh, slaughtering process or slaughtering practice need to be carried out in order to get a better quality rawhide and skin. The next one is the collection, yeah, the collection and storing and preservation, semi-processing and collection, and the products will be delivered to the, to the tanneries. Out of the uh, total uh, 
raw hide skin uh, available in the country. Uh, about 85% of the raw hide and skin delivered to the tanneries are from informal uh, uh, waste or pass, and only 50% for, uh, is collected in a proper uh, formal uh, pass. When we are talking about informal passes or this 15, 85% informal passes, we mean that there are collectors, small and medium collectors that do not really properly uh, handling the raw hide and skin and uh, the raw hide and skin have then uh, a problem when they are delivered to the uh, tunnels. The next uh, slide, uh, Michel. Dr. Zelil, I'll advise that you conclude on this one and move to the yes, next. Yes, yes, al almost. Yeah, uh, the, the yeah, the landscape, this is what I said, uh, tunnels are uh, owned by joint venture by FDI and the domestic uh, owners. Uh, the next, uh, the next slide. Michel, the next slide. Uh, yeah, this is now the finished uh, leather. Uh, as I said, now we have raw hide and skin. This is the value chain of uh, uh, producing finished leather uh, at the tannery. Uh, uh, in the tunneries, yeah, the raw hide and skin and some other inputs uh, will be uh, supplied to do the process. A tannery and uh, the tunneries will process the raw hide and skin, uh, including by adding some chemicals and some other processes. Then we're going to have the uh, end product uh, at the stage, pickled uh, crusts, uh, wet, uh, tanned crust and finished leather. We are more interested now uh, in the finished leather. The next slide. Yeah, this is the government's intervention in order to uh, protect uh, 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 semi-processed and uh, unprocessed uh, hide and skin not to be uh, exported from the country. Instead, uh, the uh, tanners and users of uh, uh, finished goods, uh, finished uh, leather uh, should be uh, uh, further uh, value added and have a better market in the uh, better market nationally or regionally or in international markets. The next slide. Next slide. Yeah, uh, this is only to show that the uh, currently uh, the uh, tunnels are uh, up, are really working and are very low uh, capacity because of. Uh, the uh, shortage of uh, proper quality raw hide and skin. Next, next slide. Yeah, this is now the leather goods. Uh, once we do have finished leather, then it should be the further process in order to get uh, uh, leather goods like the the, the major uh, leather goods produced locally are uh, the footwear uh, garments and other uh, uh, articles like belts, bags, and so on. The next step, the next slide. Yeah, uh, this is to show you that how much uh, footwear, glove, and garment is produced uh, locally and how much it is uh, really uh, uh, exported to the international market. And as you see, the footwear is the highest uh, export, item, export product, leather product which uh, amounted to about $49 million uh, in, 19, in, in the 20, uh, uh, end of 2019. The next slide. Yeah, these are the constraints in, uh, of leather sector in Ethiopia and that need really to be addressed by the government. Environment and sustainability, compliance in international, Well, the next, yeah, compliance to international standard exporting, exporting. Okay, these are now once we have all the uh, uh, products and uh, the raw hide and skin, the finished leather and the leather products, uh, we could see that there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges, problems uh, that affect the competitiveness of this sector.
in order to uh, get over these uh, challenges and make the sector competitive, the government took a certain uh, interventions, policy and technical interventions. Some of them are undertaken, uh, some of them are envisaged. Uh, these are, uh, and the uh, actions are uh, based on the uh, value chain uh, stage. The first one is the input supply where rawhide and skin is produced and chemical and accessories where the tunnels could really get uh, in order to uh, produce the finished leather. The next step, the next slide, at the production process, uh, that I, well, there is an institute that supports, for example, to the tanneries and the uh, uh, leather finished good, uh, le leather goods, uh, uh, in order to make them really competitive in, in regional and international markets. The, the next slide. Yeah, at the market level, there is a technical support from the government and at the export investment. And the last one is, the next one, yeah, an environment because tunnels are really uh, needs to fulfill all the requirements if they are really uh, 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 targeting their product to uh, export. And the importers, particularly from Europe, uh, the Northern America and uh, Japan, as well as Korea, uh, they need to uh, have a product that fulfill all the international standards. The next intervention is on incentive, coordination, logistics, and customs. These are also be considered by the government at the policy and technical level in order to make it competitive. The last one is the human uh, capacity that need uh, to be also seen in order to make the uh, sector competitive. At this uh, stage, I would like uh, Mr. Moderator uh, uh, to allow me to invite the senior experts in the sector uh, to brief uh, the major achievement of the leather sector at the national, regional, and international markets and how this success uh, could be achieved. Uh, Mr. Daniel? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nabi. Just give me a second. I, I think that uh, you said lots of important things. Um, we've already used about 18 or so minutes, and I know we're moving on uh, to your, your second slide with your collaborator. Uh, it's very interesting what you presented. I think that um, for us to, we need to unpack it to our Francophone audience. So just give us a minute. Uh, we have to sort of unpack it to our Francophone audience for perhaps one or two minutes. And then we come back to you and uh, we'll try to make it quick. We'll try to make it five minutes and then we'll wrap up with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll move to Jean-Marc Kilolo. Uh, just to do uh, a, a short summary of uh, what we've said so far. Uh, merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, je vais présenter un résumé succinct euh, des propos du docteur GCC sur euh, la production de cuir. Euh, dans son exposé, le professeur euh, GCC a parlé de la chaîne de valeur euh, du cuir qui va de l'élevage euh, bovin des animaux euh, à l'abattage ainsi que donc à, euh, à la récolte des peaux et du cuir et jusque à la, euh, au, au travail euh, des produits finaux qui sont les chaussures, les vêtements, ainsi que d'autres biens tels que euh, les ceintures et les sacs. Il a épinglé euh, quelques défis pour euh, cette industrie. Il s'agit notamment de l'élevage euh, bovin, des infections parasites et ainsi que de la pratique de l'abattage. Il note que 15% des abattages se font dans des cadres plutôt sains. Il s'agit des abattoirs domestiques, donc pour la consommation interne, et les abattoirs d'exportation. Le gros donc, des, des peaux et, et cuirs proviennent donc, de ce qu'il appelait euh, de, des arrières cours où les normes ne sont pas toujours euh, bien respectées. Enfin, pour ce qui est des tanneries, il note que 45% des tanneries sont des investissements directs étrangers et le gros est la propriété euh, des, euh, des Éthiopiens et seulement 3% sont des joints ventures. Les contraintes de cette euh, industrie sont notamment de nature financière 
ainsi que les questions de logistique. En termes de politique, on note euh, une politique industrielle qui repose sur les taxations à l'exportation en vue de promouvoir le secteur euh, domestique, ainsi que la pratique des prix planchers et également euh, améliorer la santé des bovins pour obtenir des pots de qualité. Voilà ce que j'ai noté. OK. Thank you very much uh, for your brilliant uh, résumé. Um, just say, il a dit aussi que uh, juste l'année dernière, uh, l'Éthiopie a gagné 49, 000, 49 millions de dollars uh, sur les, les produits de cuir, qui est très intéressant pour nous à noter. Uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Prof. Uh, please uh, go ahead with uh, the second segment of your presentation. Okay, uh, let's see the import substitution to leverage agribusiness. One, here we said uh, exports, uh, but better to uh, back it import substitution to leverage agribusiness. Business. Uh, the first slide, the next slide, uh, Michel. Uh, 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 Nadie, I thought you wanted your your colleague to intervene. Your colleague. Yes, 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 okay. yes. Uh, Daniel, are you there? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Can you can you please uh, briefly tell us the current status of the Ethiopian leather sector, the success, and what makes uh, uh, it to be so successful? Yeah, yeah. Thank and you, uh, 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 thank you, Dr. Navier, and thank you, moderator. I'll try to briefly, in short, uh, about the uh, leather sector uh, progress in our country. Uh, I'm a leather expert and leading uh, laser manufacturing plant for a long year. Maybe we have uh, 19 years of experience. So our uh, uh, laser industry has got problem uh, previously because we were doing pickle and wet blue. That is a semi-finished product from uh, raw material. But that one uh, is exporting to European and Asian market, which, uh, uh, which makes us to lose lion share of benefits because when we uh, need uh, for our shoe manufacturers and uh, uh, garment makers, uh, shoe bag manufacturers, we are again importing finished laser. So uh, finally, we realize this problem and uh, try to develop our way, our own way to tackle this problem and also to uh, uh, transform our laser industry from the pickle uh, with blue to finished laser production. So the, uh, uh, when I was in uh, Elico, it was a brand uh, factory in uh, Ethiopia, uh, we were trying to develop uh, uh, our own technology uh, because we cannot capitalize on imported technology that uh, doesn't give us satisfactory results. So uh, we did uh, 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 exportable items, uh, international quality standard from Ethiopian Highland ship skin the dress gloving and golf sport gloving, as well as sheep upper laser, and uh, also from goat skins uh, finished sweat laser, so that we were uh, able to send to European market and has got uh, acceptance because the laser was uh, really fascinating, this fine grain, uh, softness and touch, and we were too able to grasp uh, a reasonable market in, 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 in Europe and Asia and uh, uh, American market or also able to export to the mentioned destinations. So uh, in that uh, uh, we were able to develop, transform our uh, laser uh, tanning industry. Then after uh, now it's, uh, the shoe, uh, laser bags, laser goods, small industries, SMEs, large factories start to booming because they are able to get uh, uh, this uh, raw material for them from uh, they are start working with tanneries and able to produce quality shoe, quality bags and the quality luggage as well as uh, other uh, articles, laser articles. So they were able to design uh, fascinating bags and leathers and uh, show in the international trade fairs and leather shows. So they uh, were able to create uh, opportunity for the use. Apart from that, you know, uh, and, and, and the Ethiopian government was uh, helping to import substitution activities related to laser. So most youngsters uh, clustering in uh, in uh, small, small uh, scale 
industries and try to develop products which substitute uh, uh, imported chemicals like uh, they were producing uh, uh, surfactants, uh, wetting agents from locally available resources, and also fat liquors, which uh, uh, hugely import from Europe and uh, Asia. Also, they were able to produce degreasing agents locally, and also dye stuffs, which, which is a major input for laser production, and uh, as well as packing materials, because packing material also an input for uh, export um, system. So. This uh, helped a lot to uh, to to avoid uh, uh, you know the trade uh, balance because in laser you we export uh, chemicals and when we export this uh, import export balance was not there but now we were able to uh, achieve a good balance and apart from that the waste from the laser production uh, helps us to develop the local use to engage in uh, uh, income generation like the fletching waste were used for uh, uh, production of glue, which is a main in ingredient in the construction industry. Also, we were able to support uh, small-scale industries uh, with industrial growth production from the split, so that uh, uh, in glove importing has reduced in a reasonable amount. Uh, okay. also Thank you very much. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a wonderful testimony you're giving. Um, uh, it's a very practical example. But for want of time, uh, what we will do is I uh, will request that you share your your address, the name of your company, and your address, so that um, some key players in our subregion can get in touch with you. May I ask uh, uh, Nabi that uh, please you you share that information with Michelle? He can display it on the screen as we move along. Uh, because sure. I that the chat in the chat in the chat panel um, yeah. participants cannot actually chat uh, in the chat room, so that um they can actually grab that information from the screen uh but one question i have for you uh, quickly is um uh, uh what's the size of your company and what's your cash flow uh, uh how, how much do you make uh you know um uh, from from what you do in terms of profitability if we are privy to that information yeah um our company size is very big we have two tonneries and uh, one garment manufacturing as well as one shoe factory and I can say it is a uh, yearly revenue is 350 uh, million per in Ethiopia. Normally, is around uh, 10 million uh, US dollar. I think so. All right, that's a very interesting uh, uh, amount for cash flow. And congratulations, uh, just to say that uh, it's capital for us to 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 share uh, your contact. And I, I am sure that people from our sub region. Will be contacting you to learn from you and to build partnerships because this is what really this is all all about i'm speaking and winking at um uh, colleagues who are listening from or participants listening from chat uh my address or participant the chat because uh vraiment la fait de 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 qui c'est 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 leur affaire ils sont le plus fort en afrique centrale en termes de 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 nombre de 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 les chapters uh the 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 et il avait parlé de uh de 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 la cuite de chèvre qui était très très uh, un facteur très important uh pour pouvoir uh, avoir accès à à un marché uh, segmenté en Europe qui les rapportait beaucoup de de, de profit so I'll, I'll 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 hand over to 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 Jean you please to 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 do a a short summary of what he said Merci bien. Donc, M. Daniel Akula a parlé en fait de certaines mesures encore gouvernementales qui ont favorisé euh, la consolidation euh, du secteur, notamment la politique de substitution à, aux importations, donc ce qui a permis d'améliorer la balance commerciale et également renforcer euh, le secteur par rapport au marché local, ce qui a permis d'accroître euh, donc la, la création de revenus et comme il a dit, son chiffre d'affaires s'élève à très peu près à 10 millions euh, de dollars américains. Et fort de ce renforcement de, de capacité, euh, le cuir s'exporte en Europe, en Asie et en Amérique et le secteur compte non seulement des petites moyennes entreprises mais également euh, des entreprises de, de très bonne taille. Et grâce à ces politiques gouvernementales, 
donc, euh, le secteur a pu passer à une étape de cuir, de cuir fini, parce qu'en réalité, euh, il produisait plus euh, au départ du cuir intermédiaire et devait ou dépendait des, des importations en provenance de l'Asie pour euh, les produits euh, finis. Donc voilà en gros euh, ce que j'ai retenu de l'intervention de M. Akula. Very many thanks, uh, uh, Jean-Luc, for that uh, brilliant uh, uh, summary. Uh, this is a, a capital example of, uh, you know, playing very well in terms of the value chain. Uh, so I come back to you, uh, Nabiye, could you use two minutes to do a round of, uh, a round of uh, presentation? Yes, I'll try, I'll try. Okay, uh, that is the, the, my next uh, presentation would be on import substitution to leverage uh, agribusiness. Uh, Ethiopia exports and imports uh, balance is not uh, good. Ethiopia exports less than it imports. Therefore, there is a need of uh, uh, policy and strategic uh, action by the government. Now, narrowing uh, the trade deficits uh, uh, through import substitution is one of the ways that the government is now working on. And narrowing uh, trade uh, deficit, the next, there's, there's any, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, actually, you jumped two or three slides. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now, narrowing trade deficit should uh, be, should not only, wow, should not only be uh, through earning from exports, but saving through import substitution. Uh, however, uh, commodities for imports and substitution should be uh, based on six major benefits. Uh, Resource-based, that means availability of resource, growth potential and competitiveness, uh, poverty reduction potential, social benefits where job can be created, uh, prospects of success and outreach, uh, which is that should really cover a lot of people to be a part of the uh, part of the import substituted commodity production. Therefore, if there is a trade deficit because of high amount of imports, uh, import, uh, then uh, there is uh, a local demand. If there is a local demand, there should be, uh, uh, there should be uh, investment area. Therefore, there is need for, a need for uh, attracting both foreign and domestic uh, investors to uh, invest in the area where uh, commodities needs to be substituted and minimize uh, uh, importing from abroad. Uh, due to all these factors, the government has uh, developed its own. Uh, if you go up, Michel, two slides, two slides uh, before the, no, well, you are now uh, rolling down, but up uh, still. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. That's fine. No, no, you just. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's fine now. Therefore, the government now work on, in order to minimize, to narrowing the trade deficits, the government has uh, several strategies, regulations, and laws. And some of the uh, laws and regulations are targeted to promote the agribusiness sector. And some of the key overarching policies, uh, interventions, are uh, the policies, policy documents that get intervention in the sector, which is planned for the next 30 years from 2000, uh, uh, which, which, which started in 2013 and goes up to 2025 are uh, this, the Industrial Development Roadmap, the Industrial Development Strategic Plan, and the Industrial Development Institutional Setup. These are the basic arcing, uh, overarching policies that allow the agribusiness to be promoted in order to substitute uh, all the import items so, so that the government can minimize narrowing 
the uh, credit deficit. Now, based on these uh, uh, policies, the government starts now to promote the so-called industrial parks. There are several industrial parks in several different areas, and one of the areas that the government is now working on is the integrated agro-industrial park. The, the, these uh, integrated agro-industrial parks are based on the geographical cluster, and they have all the necessary infrastructure like road, power, water, and whatever. And there are special. There is also some. Uh, there are also some specialized infrastructure like cold cold store, uh, quarantine facilities, uh, laboratories, and quality certification centers, so that some of the material can be exported. And in order to get also the appropriate and proper raw material for the production uh, of the different uh, products that are produced in these uh, in the, in industrial parks, there are uh, rural transformation centers. The next, yeah. These rural uh, transformation centers are established in order to uh, facilitate all inputs from the scattered farmers to the, uh, industry, uh, the industries in the park. It's not only bringing raw material from the farmers to the industries or bridging the raw material to the industries, but these rural uh, transformation centers serve as also uh, to uh, build the capacity of the farmers uh, in order to produce a better quality so that the industries can also produce a better quality that could substitute the imported uh, items by those produced locally from the, by these industries. And you know, this uh, rural transformation center serves also uh, to, to provide you know, uh, raw material supply like uh, different uh, 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 inputs to the farmers so that the farmers can produce a better product uh, that can be used as input uh, for the... Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yes, may I just step in there and ask you to use uh, 30 seconds to wrap up and then uh, we'll come to you sure. with... Sure, yeah, yeah. The, fact, yeah, the last, the last uh, slide is really uh, this one. Uh, we cannot, the, uh, this, uh, this uh, agro-industries are not established uh, uh, randomly, but there are points to be considered before the establishment of uh, this agro-industries. These are the agricultural production potential for strategic community and the industrial linkage and triggering effects, the infrastructure facilities, the next one, the market potential, access to commercial uh, commercial and support service, and the, the uh, concentration of enterprise and attractiveness of investors. These are the major seven points that needs to be fulfilled before the uh, industrial parks are established in any area. This is the way how uh, the government can, uh, can reduce or narrowing the trade deficits uh, due to the exports uh, due to the high uh, uh, imports and low export items. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I mean, what you said, uh, it shows that there is a lot of work that has gone into the uh, export substitution mechanism uh, in Ethiopia. I don't yeah. want to make the point, but I'll just hand the uh, camera and microphone over to Jean-Luc uh, to give us a succinct um, uh, summary in French as it is going. Alors, euh, le docteur euh, a parlé de la politique de substitution qui euh, se justifie par le, euh, le déficit commercial de l'Éthiopie. Et pour présider à ces mesures de substitution aux importations, il y a des critères objectifs au nombre desquels la compétitivité et le potentiel de croissance, euh, le potentiel de la réduction de la pauvreté, la probabilité de succès, l'impact sur l'emploi. Et enfin, il a parlé, il a mentionné le cas euh, de parcs agro-industriels intégrés qui fournissent des intrants, euh, donc qui ont des intrants qui euh, proviennent de structures euh, basé en milieu rural, 
donc qui permet d'avoir des intrants de bonne qualité et qui permet de réaliser justement cette substitution aux importations euh, d'intrants. Et évidemment, l'attractivité euh, de ces parcs agro-industriels repose sur la concentration euh, des entreprises en un endroit précis, avec des aménités, donc ce qui accroît l'attractivité des investissements directs étrangers. Voilà les forces qui se dégagent de son propos. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Luke. At this time, uh, I would like to hand over the microphone to uh, my colleague, Lord Chico, to moderate uh, a question and answer session. I can bet my bottom dollar that uh, people want to know exactly how Ethiopia has fared in terms of the skills to be able to execute, this, able to execute the uh, uh, import substitution policy uh, in the domains of uh, leather production and in agribusiness. So over to you, Lord. Oui, thank you, Abel. We are now moving to the question and answer session, the first part of it. Uh, please uh, show your hand up and then I will give you the floor. Uh, nous entrons dans la première séquence des questions et réponses suite aux différentes présentations uh, que nous avons suivies depuis deux heures de temps. Et s'il vous plaît, uh, vous avez l'icône pour montrer le doigt ou le chat pour demander la parole et, et vous aurez la parole. La parole à qui euh, souhaiterait parler maintenant. Oui, euh, Jean-Luc, vous avez la parole. Oui, euh, merci l'autre. Uh, I, I wanted to, 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 to ask uh, a question related to <coughs> green skills. Uh, mainstreaming green skills within the, the hide and skin sector in Ethiopia. This is a sector which is presented by many actors as a, a point of excellence in, in Africa. And actually we know all the debate related to greening the skin industry and uh, market access in Europe and as a developed world. I wanted the professor to, 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 to elaborate a bit on how they, they strengthen the capacity in terms of uh, building these great skills within the industry, the skin industry, yeah. the leather industry. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Uh, is there any question to the professor too? Before I give the floor to the professor to respond. Est-ce qu'il y a une autre question uh, destinée uh, au professeur uh, avant que je lui donne la parole pour une réponse? Ben, suite au silence, euh, je donnerai la parole au professeur pour apporter des éléments de réponse, s'il vous plaît. So I'll give you the floor, professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, this mainstream of green screen in Ethiopia. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is really a very good question. Uh, the, the, uh, particularly the tannery uh, stage, that is the one which affects and pollutes the environment uh, badly. Uh, there, there is uh, a specific uh, regulation and standards uh, that, uh, that is applied uh, by the uh, tanners in order to avoid any uh, pollution discharge from the uh, tanners. Uh, tanneries should fulfill all the uh, requirements uh, before they export their products to abroad. It's not only uh, for uh, exporting, exporting products, but even for the products that are brought to the local market. Effluent, each and every uh, tanners should have at least the primary and the secondary uh, uh, effluent treatment plant. In some cases, there is a need of tertiary uh, effluent uh, treatment plant. Uh, moreover, uh, the cleaner production uh, practices are uh, highly promoted and applied uh, to uh, minimize any 
environmental negatively uh, affecting activities uh, before uh, uh, during the product the production process uh, therefore the greening process uh, the greening uh, uh, measures uh, to make the product green uh, are taken in two uh, scenarios the first one is to minimize all uh, activities that can cause the environment to be affected negatively and the second scenario is to treat any uh, wastes that come out of the plant before they are discharged into the environment and it's not only uh, treating the wastes before discharge before being discharged into the environment and taking action to minimize any negative that could contribute to the environment uh, but there is also uh, uh, supporting activities that the that the, that the industries uh, be uh, the industries can also get uh, from uh, uh, the local service providers one of the uh, service providers is of course the cleaner production center which was very strong and ultimately uh, but, but very recently due to different reasons it was weak but it's now getting again back to its strong previous uh, activity therefore action taken at the end of the product during the process and in some cases also during the uh, uh, during uh, at the level of uh, getting the raw material uh, to be processed in the tunneries the green procurement uh, is also uh, now implemented in many uh, industries, including the tunnels. Therefore, the greening skin and the having a green product is by practicing the green procurement from the input side, applying cleaner production at the processing site, and treating wastes before it is discharged to the uh, environment by doing that they fulfill all the national and international standards that makes them really uh, 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 competent uh, because of uh, uh, competent at international uh, market by through, through fulfilling all the greening procurement uh, greening uh, procedures therefore many of the ethanol's products are leveled and do have also a green product passport. And the eco labeling is also one of the uh, the activities to be also conducted in many of the tunnels. Although uh, I'm not quite sure if there are uh, industries that have already uh, eco labeled their products, but it is also promoted and tried to be introduced in tunnels. Uh, in order to have uh, uh, eco labeled uh, and uh, the, the finished leather products. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, another question, please. Uh, thank you for your really input. Uh, J'ai une question pour Jean Luc. Jean Luc, uh, quelles seraient selon vous les compétences de base? pouvant être considéré comme fondation pour impulser la diversification économique en Afrique centrale. Merci bien. Ça, c'est une, une très, très bonne question. Les fondations, euh, les, 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 les fondations en termes de compétences de base, c'est d'abord des compétences en termes de sciences, technologies et innovations pour moi. Parce que les compétences techniques d'ingénierie qui permettent en sorte, en sorte qu'on puisse développer de nouveaux produits ou être capable de nous insérer dans des systèmes de production innovants rapidement. Et le déficit dans la, dans la sous-région est énorme dans ce sens-là. Mais il va falloir dire de façon claire qu'il n'y a pas de compétences isolées aujourd'hui. Pour qu'une compétence soit apte à s'exprimer dans l'environnement industriel, 
il faut ajouter à ces compétences techniques des compétences comportementales, la capacité à travailler en équipe, la capacité à communiquer, la capacité à apprendre elle-même. Ainsi donc, il, il sera très difficile d'isoler et de dire ça c'est la base, parce que dans certains, dans certains modèles, par exemple, il y a des exemples sur le cas de, 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 des échecs des zones économiques spéciales au Bangladesh, où on établit que les compétences qui manquent, et les bons ingénieurs peuvent être là, mais les compétences qui manquent souvent, c'est des compétences à s'insérer dans une équipe, à pouvoir faire partie de cette équipe d'innovateurs. Et donc, au-delà des compétences techniques, des compétences en matière de production d'ingénierie, il faut aussi renforcer ses capacités à travailler en équipe, et ainsi de suite. Et comme M. Regues euh, vient de le dire encore, les compétences vertes sont cruciales. Vous voyez donc qu'il est difficile de dire les compétences de base, c'est lesquelles. Les compétences vertes pour un modèle de croissance et de développement porté par les ressources naturelles, ces compétences sont capitales. L'accès au marché le plus alléchant en dépend parce qu'il faut, il faut euh, faire la certification et le labelling pour montrer qu'on respecte l'environnement et qu'aussi on est en train de préserver les ressources naturelles pour les générations futures. Donc, il faut une approche intégrée par rapport aux compétences, mais essentiellement, ce qui nous manque et ce qui est important maintenant, c'est les compétences par sciences, technologie et ingénierie. Oh, merci. Merci, Jean, merci Jean-Luc. Je constate qu'il n'y a plus d'autres questions. Over to you, Abel, for the next presentation. Thank you very much, a uh, lot. Uh, appreciate. Uh, uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Jean-Luc. So I just want to quickly uh, say a word in English on what uh, Jean-Luc said, because uh, my colleague Lot asked him to actually uh, tell us what are the defining skills needed in our South and Central Africa world to move on with uh, economic diversification. And he has just said that um, there is no one size fits all. Uh, it's a matter of integrated skill set in terms of uh, you know technology so there's there's the issue of the technicity and then there's also the issue of uh, soft skills especially being able to work in teams and there's the issue of having skills uh on environmental protection so he called that in french uh green skills uh with that said i'll move to you uh jean matilolo uh to please uh, summarize the answer that uh, nabi gave Uh, to the question asked by, um, by uh, Jean-Luc. Jean-Marc, are you there? All right, it looks like we've lost Jean-Marc. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your intervention. I'll, I'll move straight on to our next presenter. Uh, we know that um, uh, Uh, the Second World War had very devastating effects on uh, a certain country called Japan. Uh, in your history of world affairs, you must have come across uh, the incidents of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Uh, but the Japanese did not fold their arms after that. They picked the pieces, and you all know where they are today. So how did this happen? Tell us, uh, Professor Shoko Yamada, over. Okay, thank you very much, Avera, for kind introduction. Can you see the slide I am sharing now? Very well. Yes. Very well. Okay. Um, okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, United Nations Commission for Africa for giving me this opportunity to share the developmental experience of my country after the World War II. Having said that, um, the history of, uh, um, oh, sorry, let me just make this share. Uh, okay. Do you see it now? Yes, okay. yes, we do. Okay. Uh, so, having said that, uh, I, I have 
uh, the history of uh, Japanese uh, economic development is not necessarily my field of specialization. Rather, my specialization is the skills development for industrial growth in uh, developing countries, uh, particularly in Africa. So today, I just want to quickly overview the history of Japanese economic development just uh, on the aspects which is relevant to the skills development. And uh, I will try to uh, ex uh, extract some lessons which might be relevant to the African context. Then toward the end of my presentation, I'd like to mention about the intervention our team in Nagoya University in Japan is trying to make in African countries. We have a project called Sky Project Skills and Knowledge for Youth Project. With this project, we are trying to somehow uh, assist the African country's government and the industry workforce to have a good match between the training and employment. So I'm going to share the, our interventions in relation to the historical ex, uh, experience of Japan. So please look at this uh, uh, figure. It shows the industrial production capacity of Japan before and after the World War II. Uh, the World War II ended in 1945, and as you know, Japan was defeated. So you can see the production capacity of Japan in machinery, steel, food, textiles, and all kinds of industry was thrashed uh, very sharply. And Japanese land was raided, attacked by the American Air Force and navies, so the land was devastated. At the same time, you can see that the uh, production capacity was not completely destroyed. There was some remaining capacity. That was the first place Japan had started off. Then uh, this is a comparison of US-Japan uh, real GDP per capita growth uh, throughout the history. And uh, Japan is a line uh, below the US. Uh, and then uh, you can see the Japanese modernization period from the late 19th century up to the World War II was uh, pretty prosperous. It, uh, it uh, grew uh, steadily. But then as soon as the World War II ended, uh, Japanese GDP has dropped very sharply. But please look at the line after the uh, uh, 1945, you can see that the growth was very steep. So that was a period which is called as uh, uh, East Asian miracle. The East Asian miracle is uh, the period between the 1950s and the end of the 1970s. So I'm going to share the kind of uh, uh, factors which contributed to the Japanese fast post-war uh, post recovery. There are endogenous factors and exogenous factors. Uh, let me start with the endogenous factors. First, as I said, the production bases were not completely destroyed, although it was mostly damaged. Uh, so uh, the uh, starting point was those remaining capacity, which became, which served as a stepping board for the heavy industry-driven economy. The second point is uh, relevant to the today's topic of skills development. There are pretty high level of uh, me, uh, average literacy and numeracy among the general public. Please look at this figure. Uh, this shows uh, uh, the school enrollment rate through the history of Japan. So uh, the blue line shows the enrollment rate of elementary school, primary school. You can see that it reached 100% universal primary education around 1900. Then uh, the red line shows the lower secondary school enrollment. Even though Japan was war devastated, it uh, achieved the universal lower secondary education also in 1950. So that was the basis of the economic takeoff. We had a, a pretty general 
uh, high level of literacy and numeracy among the population. And then that it was uh, rather uh, easier for the government to add on top of these bases, the TVET and the engineering education. And there are also exogenous factors. Uh, during the Cold War period, US military used Japanese land as a Far East uh, basis for the uh, war in uh, Korea and Vietnam. So they needed the supply of heavy industry products, and that actually boosted the Japanese economy in the 1950s and 60s. So the neighbor's uh, unfortunate condition was actually the fortunate uh, condition for the Japanese economy, uh, uh, you know, ironically. Then East Asia miracle. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but the East Asian miracle is uh, the, uh, the uh, typically means the government-led development process. The developmental autocracy uh, was very strong, and the government has designed the export-oriented industry promotion policy. And then the priority sector was clearly set. Uh, the priority was on the heavy industry, such as steel, metal, shipbuilding, and so on. And then uh, these uh, priority sectors got a special treatment like a, a tax benefit and developmental loan and as such. And along with that, the TVET and the engineering education was enhanced in support of these priority sectors. So the government adopted the regulation, series of regulations, like industrial education promotion law or science education promotion law. And then, uh, so these regulations were uh, the backbone of the a quick expansion of the TVET and the higher education, particularly on the engineering side. And I just want to uh, talk about the private sector side because Jan Luc was mentioning about the uh, public private partnership and industry training matching. That was one of the characteristic of Japanese uh, uh, human resource development during the time of the East Asia miracle. So the, uh, the private sector initiative for training their own people was very committed. And Kaizen, which also uh, Jan Luc was talking about, Kaizen is a, uh, the production improvement model which was developed in the Japanese private sector companies like Toyota Automobile during this East Asia miracle period. So side by side, the government and private sector worked side by side to promote the industries and also the human resource development. Now, uh, after the 1970s, though, the economy achieved the maturation. Once the economy maturates, then the demands for skills are diversified. That is a kind of situation I think you would also need to think in your own country context, too. When the a country doesn't have much industry, and when it was a uh, war devastated, then uh, at the very early stage, it is rather straightforward to focus on some priority sectors and focus on the hard skill development, vocational skill development. But after some uh, steady growth of the economy, then the industries diversify. For example, even within the manufacturing sector, it is not now not only the 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 heavy industry like steel or metal, but also the home appliances, watch, music instruments, computers, nuclear fusions. There are many diverse kinds of industries uh, flourish. And also it's not only the, the manufacturing sector, but also service sectors start to grow bigger, even bigger than the manufacturing sector. So then that would result in the relative diminishing of the demand for hard skill and relative increase of the demand for soft skills. So uh, let me go to the next page, which shows the uh, changing demand for the skills throughout the history of Japanese economic growth. 
In the 1950s uh, up to 1970s, during the period of East Asian miracle, as I said, the government focused on the development of hard skills, vocational and engineering skills, and that was successful. And it was more focusing on the quantitative expansion. In the 1970s, the demand is uh, not only on the quantity of hard skills, but also quality of hard skills. But when it came to the 1980s, there are more uh, demand for soft skills. Uh, for example, international skills. This is demanded by the mega Japanese enterprises, which started to operate globally. Now they need to have the negotiation with the international counterparts, and they need to have uh, uh, workers from different countries in the same workplace. So they need the international communication skills. They also need uh, creativity. And uh, sometimes they, uh, in, uh, recently, they are now talking of the problem solving skills or workplace innovations. All of these are somehow soft skill but uh, from the different dimensions. So uh, now to summarize the Japanese experience, uh, the, the implications of Japanese experiences. Firstly, the skills demand are growingly diversified and the, the pace of change is very fast. The more the economy maturate, the more the pace of change is fast. So the issue is how to cope with the changing needs on the skills. And also the model which worked in the past in other places may not apply for others in today's world. So the Japanese uh, East Asia miracle model, which was driven by the uh, autocratic government, uh, was okay in Asian context in the 1960s and 70s, but uh, the model itself cannot be straightforwardly up applied. And also the situation of economy in Africa continent alone are so diverse. Some countries uh, uh, can be considered as a catch-up economy, which start with a light industry like garment and uh, uh, leather industry like Ethiopia, which is export oriented and uh, whose uh, comparative advantage is cheap labor and favorable environment for the investors from overseas. But in some other uh, uh, countries, the economy might be more resource dependent. In this case, the uh, economy might be uh, more vulnerable to the changes of the international price of the resources. And at the same time, probably the issue is to uh, develop the basis of value added production within the country instead of just uh, exporting the resource without value addition. At the same time, recently, we see that a lot of technology innovation uh, throughout Africa. We can now uh, exchange goods through the uh, mobile phone. You know, FinTech is uh, uh, very much advanced in Africa more than in other places. So those kind of different contexts are overlapping. So now the issue I'd like to highlight is the needs that training and the policies about training should be constantly checked whether it is relevant to the current needs of the skills. And if there is any mismatch between the policy and uh, uh, current needs of the, the training, then you need to adapt it to the current needs and modify. And after a few years, you may still need to check the relevance and adapt and modify. So this is a kind of cycle you have to uh, incorporate within the policy process and the education process. Now the challenge is, how can we know? How can we diagnose accurately the skills which are available now and skills which are demanded in the labor market now? So for that matter, I would like to introduce the work we are doing as a Skills and Knowledge for Youth project, Sky project. What we are doing, 
Uh, we try to help the governments of African countries and industry organizations of African countries to diagnose the skills of workers from multiple angles and provide answers to those questions about relevance of skills and the gap between the training and employment, which uh, Jean-Luc was talking about at the beginning of this conference. Our module provides pictures about the complex relationship among cognitive skill. Cognitive skill means the literacy and numeracy and theoretical knowledge. And non-cognitive or soft skills, those communication skills or innovation skills or problem solving skills. And hard skills, vocational skills. We, we Our module try to cover all these different kinds of skills and assess the uh, skills of workers in an accurate manner. And we can also benchmark the workers' skills in comparison to other uh, participants of the survey in the same country and in other African countries. We use uh, our latest test theory to make sure the different groups of workers who take part in our assessment and uh, who might come from different countries and from different industries to be measured on the same common basis so that we can benchmark the skills characteristic of different groups on an equal basis. And we can also uh, identify the factors which influence the performance of workers. Uh, when we assess the workers' skills, we sometimes see the high performance, like worker A here, and worker D is not a very high performer. So what makes the difference of the performance between A and D? That is a kind of question which employers and also the government would have. So our assessment will give you the answers to those questions. We look at the relevance of some factors such as education background, years of experience, home background, uh, the promotion from the workplace, uh, the distance from the, uh, the workplace and absenteeism and all these kind of possible factors which might influence the worker's performance. So by doing all these things, we look at the current training programs or current policy. We also look at the current skills of workers. And we also do the questionnaire for the employers and training providers about the desirable skills. Hello. And we try to identify Hello. the mismatch. Yes? We. Oui. Yes? Do you hear me? Yes, 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 can hear. yes we can hear. Sorry, sorry okay, but can okay, you I'm going to come finish in one me. minute. Just one more thread. So I'm, I'm uh, talking about the kind of service we can provide to uh, look at the mismatch between the policy, current skills, and desired skills. And then we are going to provide some uh, proposals for the revision of the training programs. So uh, if you are more interested in what we are doing, uh, we have our website and we have Twitters, which you might want to follow. And you are also welcome to write to us directly by sending emails. Thank you very much, Abel. Thank you so very much, Shoko, for uh, that very wonderful presentation. I think uh, you put uh, the, 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 the nail of the hammer on the nail, you put your finger on it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of us are going away with a lot from that. Je voudrais uh, essayer uh, uh, très vite de faire un résumé de ce qui a été dit par le professeur uh, Shoko de l'Université de Nagoya au Japon. Uh, elle a rencontré, rencontré l'expérience du Japon après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Uh, elle a touché sur la capacité productive du pays dans la machinerie et dans la terre, qui était vraiment touchée par, par la guerre, par l'effort des guerres américaines. Et il fallait reconstruire euh, très vite. Mais le Japon, euh, les, les Japonais ont beaucoup travaillé et ils ont pu euh, avoir un miracle économique euh, à partir des années 50. C'était la même chose de, dans toute l'Asie de l'Est. Mais qu'est-ce qui a aidé Elle a parlé de, de l'eau niveau 
euh, de l'alphabétisation et des compétences de calcul euh, qui étaient à, à 100% de scolarisation euh, euh, en termes de, de l'école primaire dans les années euh, 19, euh, 1900. Donc, ils étaient déjà à 100% d'alphabétisation euh, sur euh, l'école basique euh, en, dans l'année 1900. Et ils ont capitalisé sur la machinerie qui n'avait pas été tellement touchée par la guerre. Et elle a aussi euh, parlé de la demande de, de produits finis par euh, des, euh, de, de, des Américains, surtout, pour poursuivre les efforts de guerre euh, en Asie après ça. Et même la demande aussi euh, de, provenant des pays autour de, du Japon. Euh, elle a parlé du, du Tibet, euh, du fait que le gouvernement a insisté sur euh, le Tibet, euh, qui veut dire la formation technique et professionnelle. Et c'était beaucoup plus dans le secteur de, de, de l'acier et d'autres métaux, mais aussi la construction navale. Mais juste après cela, le Japon a pu euh, euh, très vite euh, aller euh, dans la construction des de, de, de besoins de, de maisons. Euh, de, euh, comme euh, l'ordinateur et ainsi de suite. Et ils ont aussi pu, euh, divers, ça, ils ont diversifié euh, les bases pour de, euh, de, de, pour de, pour de qualité et c'est été appuyé aussi par euh, une forte réglementation gouvernementale euh, pour encourager, euh, encourager cette euh, productivité. Donc, euh, c'est comme ça que je, je, je peux résumer ce qui a été dit par le professeur Choco, elle a insisté à, à la fin euh, que euh, les gens peuvent les écrire pour euh, du partenariat, puisqu'ils font euh, un projet euh, euh, avec euh, l'Afrique en ce moment qu'ils appellent le euh, Sky Project. So, uh, uh, that said, I would like to move over to, uh, that's before we come with questions to uh, uh, Professor Choco Yamada. I'd like to take you guys to South Africa, uh, where we'll meet uh, Mr. Stadium Paki, who is the Executive Director of the African Climate Foundation. Uh, he's going to speak to us about South Africa's experience in mineral beneficiation in manufacturing and quality services. We know that uh, in Africa, south of the Sahara, uh, that's a term we don't use often these days, but we maybe use it exceptionally today. Uh, South Africa is a powerhouse for the supply of uh, uh, manufactured products. So how did they get there? Over to you, uh, Mr. Faki. Uh, Abel, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to um, uh, present something on, um, as the executive director for the Climate Foundation. Just to tell your audience, we are very new. but. Uh, this aspect of industrial development is uh, going to be important areas of our work, particularly in the green economy. If you don't mind, Abel, if I could uh, maybe just come indirectly to the question of uh, minerals beneficiation and industrial development in South Africa. Uh, and if I can talk to a, a, a topic uh, around the uh, renewables bill program in South Africa, because I think there's a, a lot of enormous amount of lessons uh, that we can learn from that. Uh, and that's uh, also uh, largely a result of the fact that uh, South Africa has had um, a strong industrial base that it could take advantage of, uh, particularly in heavy industries uh, like steel manufacturing uh, and uh, also capacity in the marine sector for shipbuilding. Uh, and we can also go to the automotive industries and so on. And that history, is, by the way, is linked to uh, the discovery of uh, cheap coal, uh, which then uh, uh, brought about the realization that if you can combine that with uh, uh, the availability of uh, coking coal, uh, iron and, uh, and steel, uh, you could begin to be, uh, build a strong industrial base. Uh, and the second part of it has also got to do with uh, South Africa's uh, apartheid history and its uh, need for military uh, capability. So there's a strong link between the, the military and industrial uh, development, particularly in the many aspects of uh, arm uh, uh, manufacturing of armaments uh, and also synthetic fuel. So I don't want to go into all the details of that. Uh, I think we can try to take that up uh, in a separate uh, process. But clearly the integration of coal, 
uh, steel and magnesium and other minerals into uh, the heavy industries and then into military capability and then other uh, civilian uh, 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 industrial development was, was core. But if I can come back to the renewable sector, uh, that is only about 10 years old. Uh, it started off uh, as a basic uh, idea of trying to reduce uh, South Africa's uh, carbon intensity. If you study South Africa's energy sector, it's 90% coal and uh, the government uh, had a very strong climate policy and uh, green economy development strategy. And uh, they then decided to uh, engage in the procurement of large scale renewables in solar and wind power. And uh, in the, at that time, the figure was around uh, uh, 20,000 megawatts, uh, which is quite a lot, uh, split roughly between uh, solar technologies and uh, wind technologies. The approach was taken to be agnostic about the technology, but to find ways to uh, scale up uh, renewable technologies as much as possible, but to also use South Africa's industrial uh, capacity to repurpose them to service uh, increased localization thresholds, uh, particularly wind and solar, solar technologies. It was harder to do that solar because the uh, global uh, global value chain for solar was uh, pretty uh, consolidated. Large scale production capacity was in China. A lot more easier to do it for wind because there were certain components of uh, wind turbines that were just too expensive and heavy to import like towers and blades. So you needed to manufacture them uh, in, in South Africa. And literally the, the uh, ability to sustain install, install capacity for wind and solar uh, was key to uh, in, increase uh, uh, localization and integration of uh, this localization strategy with uh, the current industrial base. Uh, largely, the renewables program, you could describe it as uh, one of learning by doing. We didn't have experience before. Uh, we had industrial capability, but no experience in the renewable sector. Uh, we had to rely a lot on foreign companies, uh, particularly independent power producers and uh, overseas e equipment uh, manufacturers like um, Siemens and others who had uh, global experience uh, in this area. Some of the integrated uh, independent power producers also had uh, integrated uh, models of um, manufacturing, so that they were also uh, important players in industrial manufacturing of wind turbines. Uh, so learning by doing was key. Uh, evolution of uh, state policy uh, in terms of sustained uh, capacity to for for wind and, and uh, PV uh, 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 technologies. Uh, uh, then uh, forced a organic development of the mobilization of domestic skills, largely engineering skills that were already being developed in the uh, uh, South African universities. Uh, so there were there were uh, there was a natural uh, progression from uh, certain types of engineering skills in uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering that could be repurposed to serve uh, the renewable sector. And this was coupled with uh, more experienced foreign skills. So you needed foreign skills uh, that were brought in by uh, independent power producers and uh, uh, over the the uh, uh, original equipment manufacturers, uh, and to pair that with uh, South African uh, partnerships. Largely, there were joint ventures with uh, independent producers uh, and foreign independent. Uh, Producers because that was required by South African law uh, and that allowed for the merger of foreign and domestic skills to be able to uh, integrate in the development of the renewable sector in South Africa. Key to that was, uh, of course, good uh, coordination and that was achieved by the establishment of a focused single uh, independent power producer office that was able to coordinate uh, a government procurement and a bidding process. So we uh, largely the, the install capacity was done through a bidding process. When you start uh, at the beginning of this process, uh, because of the learning rates are low, uh, in other words, there aren't 
might if there isn't not ex enough experience it takes a while for a local domestic uh, players to understand the industry and the technology it takes a while for that uh, uh, to to happen and so the costs are usually high at the early phase but if you did a good bidding process in this case was an auction model in south africa those costs rapidly came down uh, you needed certain types of policy uh, incentive like uh, tax uh, depreciation allowances for a new uh, uh, infrastructure capacity and for new manufacturing. Uh, the key to it was uh, also joint ventures. Uh, mostly, as I said earlier, was for independent power producers and not in the original uh, equipment manufacturing space. There was very little of that. And then uh, in order to maximize um, uh, localization, we needed to understand the global value chain for PV uh, and solar, uh, sorry, for wind technologies to understand how much of localization uh, could be achieved in a domestic uh, economy. Uh, subsequent to uh, a strong renewables build, uh, special economic zones uh, were identified, and there's one in South Africa, uh, in Cape Town, for example, where I live, uh, for green economy activity. But there are a couple of lessons in this. Uh, the first is that uh, you don't have to always wait for uh, new skills to develop you, uh, in, a, in a specialized area. You can, if you have very good uh, science and technology, uh, you know, um, education system that you're able to generate uh, good engineers, you can always repurpose them uh, to serve uh, a particular sector as it's evolving. And those skills, then become, uh, uh, they, they, they reach a, a rapid momentum of organic development uh, in collaboration with uh, foreign uh, skills development. We've had uh, then specialization beginning to happen in, in universities and in the technology uh, centers, uh, and also the South African uh, Department of Science and Innovation developed a, uh, through its na uh, national innovation system, uh, capacity in the universities to do research and uh, to develop further uh, these skill. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, a very good program was uh, suddenly shut down because of political economy issues, because it uh, the renewables program was beginning to threaten uh, the coal industry. Uh, so the government uh, stopped halfway, I would say not halfway, but quarter of the way of the program. This has had impacts on uh, localization and manufacturing. Many of the blade manufacturing companies have actually shut down. Uh, the fact that we set up an SEZ is now uh, inconsequential because you can't have a special economic zone if you don't have uh, a strong renewables technology build program that can then have spillovers the in terms of manufacturing uh, into the special economic zone and the other failure was that we did not uh, build flagship companies that could pair up with original equipment manufacturers in a way in the way that allowed us to be able to move up the uh, industrial development ladder and in which uh, local knowledge could be sustained and the fourth is that we did not have a strong regional export strategy that helped us to uh, enable uh, investment in South Africa to be able to uh, move into the region. The fifth thing is that uh, what uh, the one other important value that has come about that is often uh, missed in the industrial de uh, development and manufacturing is that there are lots of uh, knowledge is generated. They themselves can be commoditized. And so you could have um, export of services from a nascent and new technology sector that could be made available not only in the region, but outside of the region. And that's really what has happened, that many of the companies which uh, are, were not able to continue further developing uh, their programs in South Africa exported their skills outside of South Africa to countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other African states. So services in manufacturing and industrial development is another level of skill and export uh, because you don't always have to export the hardware, you can also export the software, which is the knowledge and the experience. And so that's very important. Finally, I would like to say that uh, touching on your uh, importance of uh, industrial development in Central Africa, 
I would recommend that we need to think out of the box and that we begin to think about uh, special economic zones that are a shared uh, venture between a number of states in the sub-region that uh, focus on a particular technology or industrial capability. That shared uh, um, a special economic zone can service um, uh, can be uh, can be serviced by different endowments by different countries in the region, whether it's skills, whether it's capital, or whether it's the mineral base that they have, and it could uh, aggregate and consolidate. And that special economic zone can be co-owned uh, because these are usually these industrial parks or special economic zones are actually companies that manage. Uh, uh, these economic developments in the SEZs, they could be co-owned by the participating countries. And e eventually what will happen is that if you reach this levels of concentration and clustering of industrial capability in a shared way, they began to spill over into individual countries because then individual countries can take up some of this um, capability to uh, uh, transfer that uh, either within the sector or outside of the sector. And I would highly recommend that given the uh, shortage of uh, uh, skills and capital in the region for industrial capability, that we think of SEZs as servicing not only the needs of uh, a sub-region, but then the region as a whole. And we, we haven't talked about the African Free Trade Agreement. That would be an important lever uh, to uh, enable these kinds of, of things. I would say the second part of it is that universities can be too slow in uh, filling the skills gap. So we need to think about other uh, strategies to very quickly scale up uh, special uh, skills uh, by, through special training hubs that can be tailored to the needs of these industrial development zones and uh, they could be quite focused and uh, people who are trained in these uh, rapid uh, industrial uh, you know zones and, and, and skills can then be further upgraded with their skills with other university uh, education. So think of this in a, in a kind of flipped way. Think of developing skills that are needed for industrial capability in the special economic zone, but then the universities supply a longer term capability. They do not supply the first uh, round of it. Uh, that is done through the special training hubs. Uh, universities play longer run roles uh, through research and training. Uh, if I can leave you with that summary for now, uh, I think we don't run out of time. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that brilliant expose, uh, Mr. Fragim Faki. Uh, just before I move to my colleague uh, uh, Jean Makilolo for um, his uh, summary in French for our francophone uh, listeners, I just have this question which I think is pertinent. It might be lingering on the minds of many others who are watching. Uh, Johannesburg is called Egoli, city of gold. It was built on gold. Kimberley was built on diamond. How did they do? Uh, you know this sort of beneficiation. Uh, uh, process skills to beneficiate uh, these minerals uh, to be able to have the kind of income that uh, we can see uh, physically, you know, has made Johannesburg a wonderful city and Kimberley a beautiful one. So a, a lot of it is depending on um, the domestic situation. For example, in South Africa, uh, the uh, inability of mining companies to uh, uh, take capital out of the country because of capital controls, uh, uh, force them to, uh, uh, you know, think about uh, greater beneficiation in collaboration with other government uh, policies. And that led to uh, uh, processing and beneficiation for export purposes. And I think that was one of the key drivers. Uh, in the case of the diamond sector, the, we had uh, De Beers, which had a strong monopoly over the diamond sector. In fact, it set up with uh, Russia what is called a central uh, selling organization. So uh, diamond exports were a, a result of uh, the ability of uh, a particular private company to capture uh, maximum value. And so it had an incentive to be able to uh, beneficiate and uh, process as much of the diamonds uh, domestically as possible because it has control over the global market in a kind of monopoly way in, in terms of the pricing and the marketing uh, of diamonds. Gold is a lot more complicated because it was um, part of the uh, gold standard at the time. 
and so uh, gold exports were were important, but they were need they needed uh, sources of power, so there was uh, stronger integration uh, between coal, steel, uh, and the power sector. Uh, largely, gold um, uh, manufacturing uh, was not substantive, but gold exports were. Um, and but original equipment manufacturing for mining uh, 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 resulted in local um, assembly and uh, uh, cross uh, export into the rest of Africa over time. There's a lot more detail uh, around this. Uh, you know, uh, I don't have all the expertise to answer uh, or in the more detailed questions around this. This is my brief understanding of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that um, uh, um, the, your, your answer was, was was pretty excellent. I'm sure that uh, my director, who is a, a mining aficionado, will have a lot to, to say in that regard. Um, so uh, I'd like to hand over the microphone to my colleague, Lord Chico, to uh, moderate a, a session on questions and answer following the presentation of Shoko and Salim. Over to you, Lord. Yes, thank you, Abel. I thought that we should have a summarized uh, issue on this by Jean-Marc before moving on. Oh, yes, to that, the yes that, that was asleep. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean-Marc, please, uh, over to you for a summary of uh, uh, this. Un uh, sommet, une récapitulation de ce que M. Salem Faki a pu dire sur l'expérience de l'Afrique du Sud. Merci. Alors, M. Salem Fakir a fait euh, un rendu intéressant de l'expérience de l'Afrique du Sud en matière d'énergie renouvelable. Il a noté que ce secteur est un secteur euh, naissant parce qu'il n'est pas plus âgé que 10 ans. Mais la genèse de ce secteur a pu compter sur l'expérience industrielle de l'Afrique du Sud notamment dans les secteurs du charbon, de l'acier et du magnésium. Donc l'existence ou la préexistence d'un secteur industriel lourd a facilité en fait l'éclosion du secteur des énergies renouvelables. Et il a parlé d'un processus qui a été un processus d'apprentissage par la pratique, communément appelé en anglais « learning by doing », où on se lance dans cette aventure sans connaissance antérieure, mais grâce à à une solide expérience dans des secteurs connexes. Alors, la consolidation du secteur des ressources renouvelables a été rendue possible grâce à des joints ventures avec des compagnies de l'étranger, ce qui a permis un réel transfert des technologies. Alors, il a également mentionné que pour des raisons de politique économique, euh, l'initiative des énergies renouvelables a dû ralentir, notamment à cause de ses effets délétères sur le secteur du charbon. Concernant les faiblesses du secteur, il a mentionné l'absence des champions nationaux qui auraient pu avoir l'étendard au-delà des limites nationales, notamment par une stratégie d'exportation laquelle a fait euh, défaut. Mais il a mentionné qu'au-delà euh, des exportations de produits, il existe également des exportations d'expérience et de savoir. Enfin, en concluant son propos, il a euh, donné des orientations pour repenser le concept des zones économiques spéciales. En l'occurrence, en parlant euh, des zones économiques euh, spéciales transnationales qui permettraient aux différents pays partie prenante de cette initiative, de euh, maximiser ou tabler soit sur la base de leur richesse minérale, du capital financier et ou des compétences, avec le bénéfice pour les participants de bénéficier des effets boule de neige, spillover effect, pour donc chacun de ces pays. Ces effets euh, de boule de neige euh, se manifesterait non seulement dans le secteur euh, en l'espèce, mais également au travers de différents secteurs. Il a mentionné également que la création des programmes universitaires dans le domaine des énergies renouvelables peut être lent, et compte tenu de cette contrainte, il faut alors penser à des unités de formation 
qui vont justement servir, préparer la main d'œuvre, habiliter à travailler dans ces zones économiques spéciales. Et à ce moment-là, les universités pourraient entrer en danse en fournissant les capacités sur le long terme. Voilà euh, le rendu de ce que j'ai retenu. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Marc, pour ce résumé. Et je, je veux passer le micro uh, tout de suite à, à l'autre uh, pour uh, uh, la modération de la session questions-réponses. Merci. Euh, merci, Abel. Euh, comme, vous, comme on a vu, euh, on a suivi l'exposé du professeur Choco sur l'expérience japonaise en matière de compétences depuis la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Et on a suivi aussi l'excellent exposé de Salim Faki sur l'expérience sud-africaine et les propositions de zones économiques spéciales ou zones économiques euh, euh, régionales. Et nous apprécions euh, l'excellent résumé de Jean-Luc, dont les capacités synthétiques euh, n'ont plus besoin d'être démontrées. Et la parole à qui veut la prendre pour une question soit dans le chat box, soit en levant le main, en signalant par une main levée, pour permettre euh, de vous donner la parole et, et poser votre question. La parole à, à qui veut la prendre. Oui, monsieur Jeter, euh, vous avez la parole. Yes, um, th thank you very much, uh, Lord Sandeville and Jiangu. I, I thought that at this stage, uh, given this very, very rich set of uh, uh, presentations, uh, that um, we should perhaps try and, try and uh, um, reflect a bit about what is it that the picture is, is what, what, the picture is, what kind of picture is emerging. Um, I think uh, from Professor Salim, I think uh, for me at least it became very clear uh, that we need to have a very good understanding of where in a particular value chain we are best located or can we be best located to utilize our uh, endowments with a view to building competitive uh, capabilities and then uh, move up in the ladder. I think that is one very critical articulation of what is our strategic objective with this diversification. So that we, we don't uh, go into uh, a particular value chain in a vacuum we need to be able to do that very granular analysis to say, yes, we can go here and this is where we should uh, uh, invest more because we'll be able to go up in the ladder. And uh, then the um, uh, both uh, presentations uh, from Prof Professor Choko and, uh, and Salim made reference to uh, the existing base in the case of Japan. I think the fact that notwithstanding the Second World War, there was a productive capability, a base on, on, on which any other development uh, trajectory was, was based uh, for the lack of better word. And I think in the case of South Africa also, all that industrial policy during the apartheid era Provided, I mean, the foundation on which some of these things are, are I mean, could be could be uh, sort of um, um, be part of the future policies. So I think understanding also uh, that uh, is important. What is the base on which we can build uh, our uh, economic diversification strategies uh, in uh, the sub region becomes in, in interesting. So the profiling. Uh, of that capacity, uh, be it um, cognitive or non-cognitive capabilities, 
uh, and then where are the greatest concentrations of our endowments, our, our factors, and so on and so forth. And then on that basis, we can design our, our strategies accordingly. I think this is, for me, very important. And, and the case of, of Ethiopia, our earlier discussion, uh, equally uh, in this idea of the catch-up economy. What is it, and all of our economies here are, I mean, for one or another type of typology, we can consider them catch-up economies. So what is it that in the, in the in ongoing sort of uh, context, what can we uh, um, sort of uh, base on our strategies? And um, addressing uh, local procurement needs. Now, COVID, as you know, made this a very compelling case because supply routes uh, have been disrupted and uh, a lot of the companies, big or small, are now thinking of localizing uh, at least a portion of their supply value chain. That then provides a, a very, very important opportunity for us to localize the industry. So the local content uh, um, policies become much more, um, let's say, palpable um, for uh, private sector, uh, for um, you know, even in engaging with the international community, WTOs of this world and so on. So uh, this is what I'm seeing as, as an emerging picture, and I'd like to hear, I mean, perhaps the reaction of uh, uh, both Professor Salim, Professor Choko, and of course uh, our good friend, I guess, uh, Daniel earlier. Uh, what are their views about that? What do they recommend specifically? for this region on how to address the skills and competence development conundrum in the context of all of these uh, opportunities, at the same time, the challenges. The skills base here is not perhaps, we, don't, we might not have that same, uh, uh, um, let's say, legacy capacity that uh, characterizes Japan or for that matter, South Africa. How would you go about uh, addressing this in the context of, of, of Central Africa. I mean, I fully agree with your suggestion, Professor Salim, about uh, regional uh, and um, special economic zones in which we can federate uh, the, 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 the entire region uh, with a view to perhaps addressing some of those challenges. But more of your advice on, on how we could go about this would be I mean, very, very uh, useful for us. Thank you very much. This is a very, very fascinating conversation. Thank you. Uh, Maybe thank Yamada you. want to say something and then I can come in. Yamada, do you, would you like to say something? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, respond to the point raised by uh, Mr. Pedro about the current uh, emerging situation with the COVID-19 and some of the changing dynamics of the economy. Uh, as a specialist of uh, education and skills, I'm looking at the current situation as a ch changing the uh, dynamics of the, the notion of knowledge itself. You know, uh, when we, we do not have access to the, the, the workplace directory and when we have to uh, uh, move forward, the, the business without meeting face to face. I think the, uh, it is difficult for us to control the process of production very much. Uh, rather, uh, we have to uh, control the outcome of production. And that is actually something uh, uh, the specialist of TVET has been long discussing in the uh, recent years about the uh, outcome-based education, but actually because of some existing constraints, those uh, discussion about outcome-based education was just a matter of talk, but it didn't really actualize. But because of the COVID-19, we are kind of forced to uh, control the uh, work conditions and uh, uh, training provision based on the outcome-based approach. So I think we should take this as an opportunity to shift real, in the real sense to the outcome-based uh, business management and also the skills development. And uh, one of the uh, example we may want, uh, I may want to share is uh, to provide the training and pro uh, provide the skills assessment online. 
that kind of effort uh, is uh, going on uh, within our initiative of Nagoya University and also in partnership with many uh, stakeholders in United Nations organizations and developing country governments. So I hope we can develop that kind of partnership uh, with the participants here today and also with the partners of you guys to uh, you know, uh, make sure the quality of skills and quality of training uh, will not be damaged by the lack of direct access to each other. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Abel, can I go? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Pedro, I think you you did such an excellent summary, and I think you've alluded to some of the steps there. And I, I do think that in Central Africa, you know, what uh, what you have is is very good endowment. Is of course uh, you got uh, extensive forest uh, and natural ecosystems that are of of enormous value. Uh, and then the second part is the, the agricultural sector. And I think those two things, uh, you know, just if we start off with figuring out what other value added uh, activities can be added uh, in terms of beneficiation. Uh, also, of course, minerals is, is another area. I think minerals are a bit harder to, to, to uh, extend beneficiation unless you've got deep industrial capability. But uh, we could start off with some you know, low level stuff that in which you then grow uh, expertise and knowledge over time. I think there are two elements that uh, you need to think about is um, uh, the, as you pointed out, the natural endowment, what, what does that look like and how, how you can exploit that as a comparative advantage, uh, how much of the skills base you currently have or have to align with uh, uh, but, you know, foreign partners that can bring capital and expertise. I think there a better job can be done. Uh, and then to uh, figure out how you can grow some of those skills very rapidly with cross-linking with local uh, enterprises and joint ventures, uh, or perhaps with a flagship company. It could be state-owned, it could be private, uh, you know, it doesn't matter as long as its performance is very clear. So, um, and then you need a lot of other things like policy, you need industrial, uh, you need an industrial development corporation. Uh, but I think that uh, the integrated resources of uh, all the participating Central African countries is perhaps the best way to maximize uh, cooperation and collective uh, engagement around these issues. And then it can be uh, concentrated and spilled over. And I'm, I'm also thinking that the, the example of the uh, tannery, uh, you know, and production uh, capacity that Ethiopia has, has uh, developed is an excellent example to go through. So we've got to start over where you are and, and uh, uh, you must have a 20, 30 year horizon. It can't be short term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your response. I'll quickly move to you, uh, uh, Nabi. Are you there? Can you speak to the issues raised by uh, Mr. Pedro? Hola, Ethiopia. Hola, Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa. Are you there? It looks like we don't have. Uh, uh, no, I, yes, he's there. He's there. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, there was a power interruption. I didn't uh, hear what uh, Mr. Petro. Yes, uh, uh, the, the, meat and, the meat and potatoes of his intervention was uh, where are the low hanging fruits for Central Africa? Where exactly should we put our finger on moving forward? We are a people in a hurry. So please, uh, you know, take us through a fast, a fast train. Yeah, uh, the major, the major problem, the major intervention should be uh, at the uh, energy generation. The first one, uh, the second one is uh, uh, to uh, act uh, uh, to identify first the highest potential uh, resources for the uh, uh, industrial development in the country. Uh, from my uh, uh, experience and from my uh, very short assessment of what I have uh, observed, uh, the uh, livestock potential in Central Africa is really very high. Therefore, uh, there is a need of assessing 
uh, the uh, livestock potential and try to see how it can be, uh, how it can contribute to the economic development by putting uh, uh, diff the agribusiness uh, industries in the country. But in order to get this agribusiness uh, uh, industries in place, uh, there is a lot of uh, factors to be seen in advance. One of the factors to be seen is energy, the amount of energy generated in the countries. If you look at, for example, the amount of energy generated in Chad, it is really very, very small. Although the country has a high potential of uh, solar energy and a certain amount of also uh, uh, wind energy. Therefore, the first investment should be on energy. And the second one is identifying the potential area where the country has the highest benefits, where the country can really exploit. In my view, the uh, livestock uh, potential can be exploited by adding value, meaning that by putting a value adding process and by looking at also the uh, the value adding, uh, the value chain of uh, livestock uh, from uh, animal husbandry to the end of, uh, for example, uh, uh, leather product or meat product or dairy products because there are different uh, 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 products that can be uh, uh, that can be produced uh, from one major source, namely from livestock. Uh, different products can be uh, produced, as I said, dairy product, uh, meat product, leather. Therefore, looking at which I mean, looking at the highest potential that the a country has, and then uh, bark on that. And from my assessment, the livestock is the highest potential where the uh, Central Africa countries can exploit. But before that, in order to have all the processes in place, there is a need of major factor, and that is energy. Okay, thank you very much. I see that uh, Salim Faki, Mr. Yes, I, I just want to be very short, and I want to echo Nabi's uh, comment about energy. In fact, is a point I, I forgot to, to mention. Uh, the, 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 the strength of your industrial capability is very dependent on good energy supply and high quality energy supply. And this is something that I think uh, will unlock many of the kind of industrial development uh, needs in Central Africa. And it's something that I think needs to be worked on uh, very actively. Uh, otherwise, and reliable energy that is available for 24 hours at cheap cost. Uh, is crucial uh, uh, for for this. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, brief intervention. I'll go over to you, Jean-Marc. Can we have a recap of this in French? The uh, director of uh, the CEA Bureau of Africa Central has uh, mentioned the importance of an granular analysis to identify the sectors precise dans lesquels investir pour remonter l'échelle et également développer les compétences dans ce contexte tumultueux du Covid-19. Par où commencer La question qu'il a adressée à nos intervenants. Répondant à cette question, Madame Choko Yamada note que, en raison des mesures de distanciation sociale, il devient difficile, in situ en personne, d'évaluer les compétences. C'est pourquoi il faut penser à des modalités euh, en ligne pour évaluer les compétences des personnes, de manière à s'assurer que la qualité des compétences n'est pas endommagée par le manque d'accès des, euh, des personnes pour procéder donc à cette évaluation. Pour M. Fakir, il note que l'Afrique centrale est riche en dotations naturelles qu'il s'agisse des écosystèmes ou encore des minerais. Il revient encore une fois à son credo euh, d'une euh, coopération euh, pour un développement industriel, une action concertée euh, entre plusieurs pays. Il note également que dans le cas de la production euh, des, du cuir en Éthiopie, euh, ça prend du temps 
20 ans a-t-il mentionné. Pour M. Nabillé, il note que la provision de l'énergie est une condition sine qua non de succès. Et parmi les activités éventuellement porteuses, il y a l'élevage. Il s'agit en fait, pour les pays d'Afrique centrale, d'ajouter de la valeur. Et euh, le long de la chaîne de valeur, en commençant par l'élevage jusqu'à la production de viande, de cuir ou encore des produits laitiers. Il insiste sur le fait que le Tchad a un potentiel énorme d'énergie solaire et éolienne et donc il y a des possibilités à prendre. Rebondissant sur cette intervention, M. Fakir mentionne en fait que la robustesse d'une industrie dépend de la qualité de l'offre énergétique qui soit fiable et à un coût abordable. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jean Makilolo, for that. Um, I saw that someone had their hands raised. Um, I saw uh, ICE webinar 20. Est-ce que quelqu'un a levé la main? Nabiye? Abel? Yes. Yes, Nabiye, come in and then Adama. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, goes to Professor. Uh, Yamada. Hello? Yes, I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the proposed uh, revised training program, uh, I think it, this was uh, prepared or uh, before the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, did you get the chance to revise by considering uh, these proposals, uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Should I answer now or should I wait for another comments? Go ahead and answer. Go ahead and answer. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very relevant question. Actually, that is something we are trying to do now. Uh, uh, before the COVID-19, uh, we did the skills assessment and the service uh, more directly. We visit uh, uh, each country where we do the assessment and uh, we collected the participants uh, directly to the uh, same room and uh, we, we did the uh, practical skills assessment and also the written test and everything. But now, uh, we have outsourced our, uh, our uh, system to the uh, engineer who is now developing the online uh, program. So uh, the, our plan is to develop the online service, at least the, the written test and questionnaire part of our skills assessment. Uh, online without visiting factory by factory or the uh, school by school. But uh, the challenge is uh, a vocational skills assessment side. We still need to have the participants to come to the, uh, the venue. So that is uh, the only part which we still have to do in the conventional manner. But other part, we are going to make the uh, service online pretty much uh, by the end of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shoko. I'll come to you, uh, Adama, and that will be the last intervention and we round, we round off. Adama, your microphone is muted, I, I can imagine. Okay, thank you, Abel. Uh, my question is uh, uh, specifically uh, to uh, I mean, the different participant experience, uh, but more importantly to uh, Professor Yamada that uh, I appreciate uh, really being here. It's uh, in the case of Japan, in the case of Japan, uh, the role uh, that the, uh, the military, the role that the, uh, the military or the army uh, play in terms of uh, industrial 
strat uh, development strategies, uh, particularly uh, in uh, uh, resolving some of the uh, key uh, skill uh, skill uh, skill gap areas in in the civilian part. Uh, 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 what if you could share a little bit the approach uh, adopt because in our region. Uh, I would say some 30% in some country, 25% of government budget is going to defense, defense or security. So this uh, part of the government system in Africa in, is taking huge amount of budgetary resource, where when we look at the portfolio of skill, uh, m money that's going to skill, and uh, not much is going uh, to skill, uh, 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 I mean high skill, I, I'm not talking elementary level, but the high skill part, the research and innovation part is almost 1% budget. We are, we are even struggling to have to meet the 1% GDP goal. So what is the, the, the Asian countries in general, but particularly in Japan, the, that part of industrial uh, skill development transferred from military to to make it happen uh, in the civilian part of the economy. That's actually excellent question. And uh, probably I need to share the background of the Japanese post-war situation. As I said, Japan was defeated. So the US uh, occupation army completely dis, uh, dismantled the Japanese army. And so uh, the uh, Japanese, uh, as I said, Japanese industry provided some uh, uh, products to the American army during the Cold War period. But the Japanese army itself doesn't exist, but rather it is the, called a self-defense force. Self-defense force is different from army. So that difference I should point out. At the same time, okay, I, I think the point Mr. Adama has raised is very important. The large part of the budget of many African countries uh, goes to the military. And uh, uh, I think it, it is also one of the biggest major employer of the, the young workers, particularly from the rural uh, poor communities. And uh, uh, so TVET, Technical Vocational Education, is considered as a, a one of the significant means to, uh, you know, uh, re, uh, 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 re accommodate those people who are in the armies to uh, be part of the society outside of the army uh, with the skills to fit to some of the industries available for them. So, for example, the Japanese government, JICA, has many projects in Africa and Latin American countries to support those former uh, fighters to be uh, reskilled and be part of the civil society. So uh, I think it is not the experience of Japanese society per se, but based on the Japanese experience of supporting developing countries who went through the war uh, and uh, uh, who, uh, who uh, the, the workers, young people who are employed in the military, uh, the TVET has been a very major means to uh, relocate those uh, young people into the civilian society. So I think uh, I, I myself personally do not have the experience of supporting those uh, uh, former military workers, but the Japanese government, JICA has a lot of cases of supporting those things. So uh, if there is any chance for us to have a, a joint discussion with the JICA staff uh, in some of the African countries, countries, we will be able to uh, provide some good uh, lessons from the TVET programs for former army uh, workers. 
Thank you very much. I hope uh, it is some kind of uh, response to the, uh, Mr. Adama's question. Thank you very much, Shoko. Uh, Jean-Marc, if you're there, can we have a uh, one and a half minute wrap of this? Uh, très bien. Donc, uh, concernant le, la question de, du professeur Adama, uh, quelle est l'expérience en fait du Japon, de l'armée uh, japonaise à transférer la technologie au secteur privé? La réponse du professeur Shoko, c'est tout simplement de dire que le Japon, uh, par le truchement de son agence de développement uh, JICA, s'est employé à former euh, dans le cadre des programmes de réinsertion sociale, donc des militaires démobilisés, euh, donc au travers des programmes TVET destinés à ces anciens militaires. C'est l'expérience que le Japon a, mais dans son propre sol, le Japon, ce transfert de technologie du secteur militaire au secteur privé ne s'est pas effectué pour des raisons historiques évidentes, l'armée japonaise ayant été démantelée après la victoire des alliés, précisément euh, les Américains qui ont contrôlé euh, le, secteur, euh, le secteur de l'armée. Par contre, le, les industries lourdes ont fourni du matériel pour le réarmement du Japon euh, dans la péninsule. Voilà ce que je retiens. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, we are getting to the end of our webinar today. Um, I'd like to call on uh, the director of the Sovereign General Office for Central Africa of ECA, Mr. Antonio Pedro, if you can give us a one or two minute word of wrap up. I know that you already came in, but uh, I think uh, you should come in at, at this juncture uh, to put a cap on it and then I will uh, close. Thank you very much, Edo. Thank you very much, uh, professors, uh, for uh, sharing your, your knowledge with us. And thank you very much to all the participants of this webinar. I think we've had, uh, uh, during this uh, three hour or so conversation, uh, a couple of gems uh, that we can uh, retain as we try to articulate the strategies on how to uh, generate uh, skills, uh, improve competences, uh, and um, to respond to the challenges of the sub-region. Uh, I think, as in many countries, if you go to the US, they talk of the industrial energy, uh, chemicals, pharmaceutical and defense complex uh, as the embryo on which a lot of the things that are happening in that country um, are sort of, uh, sort of that's, that's the, the, the nuclear. So I think uh, uh, Professor, um, so we made reference to that uh, in the case of South Africa. Uh, I think uh, in our first discussions uh, with Adama in, uh, in chat, we threw that as one of the ideas that we could explore. Uh, hence his question, because as you know, it's a very strong army. And then the question is how can't we mobilize all of this energy for industrialization, taking into consideration the needs of the defense sector and so on and so forth. So that as, as another organizational uh, unit um, or, or cluster of some sort is something that one could explore as a means to, to providing first class um, expertise, skills, um, uh, factors and so on in the typical cluster zone or special economic zone, but in this case, bringing together uh, different uh, government departments. So again, underscoring the importance that um, our economic diversification and industrialization agenda is not the business of the Ministry of Industry uh, alone. It really require the involvement of many other uh, stakeholders, including, of course, private sector, universities, technology centers, and so on and so forth. Um, 
I think we also uh, heard uh, this interesting idea of the regional value chains and clusters, uh, which we need to uh, look at it, uh, how to make a, a very good business case of all of it. The idea of retrofitting, reprofiling uh, existing uh, uh, skills, again, um, is something that we've heard a couple of times. Um, a skills base that uh, in the past was available to pursue one development agenda uh, could be redirected to address other cases. I think the case of renewable energy in South Africa, I mean, is quite telling. So uh, how can we engage in that retrofitting uh, or repurposing of our skills base? based on that assessment uh, of, um, of our uh, comparative advantages. I also like the idea of commoditizing knowledge, uh, because indeed, um, if, and I, in my earlier introduction, when we start this conversation, I made reference to the mid-income track uh, and uh, including in resource-rich countries in the Gulf states, uh, which uh, have not made significant investments in building that uh, productive capability, the knowledge uh, capability, the innovations, the human capital that is required for you then to break out from, from the trap. So uh, we have knowledges that can be commoditized uh, the spillovers, the knowledge linkages uh, are an opportunity that should be part of our policies as well. Um, and uh, uh, in the extractive sector, we've said we need to move from first come, first served, which is uh, one of the um, traditional or classical uh, licensing of uh, procedures for Munda terrains to one where we auctioning, especially in the areas where we have very good knowledge about geology, there's a very strong uh, mining uh, tradition and so on. So the risks are minimized. And you utilize, you utilize your auction to put there all of your uh, buildable factors uh, that respond better to your industrial development uh, objectives. Meaning, uh, if you want more value addition of your uh, um, timber or whatever, then in issuing licenses for whoever wants to come and, and uh, explore our timber, then you put that as one of the factors. So whoever then uh, has um, the highest scores that meet our own developmental agenda, that's the person that uh, we can uh, award the license because then through that particular licensing procedure, you can achieve your industrial development agenda. So this is one very smart way of uh, uh, achieving your strategic objectives by using your knowledge, your comparative advantage, your uh, endowments to pursue your industrial policy. Um, so basically to say we have quite a lot, uh, we've learned quite a lot from today's um, uh, conversation. Uh, we will uh, digest this, try to put this thing into some sort of uh, consolidated policy briefs uh, as an input to our intergovernmental committee of experts uh, that, as I said, we're planning to organize it um, early November. It's going to be a virtual event. So let me thank everyone that uh, was part of our conversation today and invite you to uh, continue to be part of our family uh, and, of course, be present during our uh, ICE meeting in November. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, for those that uh, profess Islam, uh, happy Eid. Um, enjoy and look forward to the next opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being there. I would like to ask uh, that um, uh, you
please take particular note of the email contacts that are on the screen. Uh, so if you want to get in touch with uh, any of the speakers, uh, Shoko from Japan, uh, Salim from South Africa, Nabiye from Ethiopia, uh, to further share experiences, and especially our Ethiopian friend who came in to, to tell us about his success story of uh, a leather industry. If you want to get in touch with them, please, you can email us and we'll put you in touch. Uh, this said, I'd like to call on everyone to come aboard with their cameras on so that we can screenshot and uh, take a, a, an electronic family photo. S'il vous plaît, il faut maintenant ouvrir uh, vos caméras pour qu'on puisse uh, uh, prendre une photo de famille avant de conclure. Michel, can you disable your screen share? So why Michel is uh, disabling his screen share for us to come aboard uh, to just to kill that air, I'd like to, je vais un peu récapituler uh, ce qui a été dit en français. Uh, on a parlé des expériences des pays en Éthiopie. Uh, C'était uh, uh, la question d'un effort particulier fait par le gouvernement pour récalibrer la chaîne de valeur uh, sur les cuits et, et les pots. Euh, aussi un effort du gouvernement dans euh, la réglementation en faveur des exportations. Euh, au Japon, c'était une question de l'alphabétisation qui était à 100% vers 1900 en termes de l'école primaire. Et puis les compétences sur les calculs, euh, c'était aussi une question d'évaluation des compétences euh, de manière pratique et euh, la, mis, euh, la mise en exergue de euh, la productivité en machinerie, mais aussi la diversification vers d'autres secteurs comme l'électroménagère. Euh, en Afrique du Sud, on a mis l'accent sur la machinerie, surtout dans le contexte de l'apartheid, mais aussi euh, il y a une base de compétences en ingénierie euh, dans des universités qui sont très vite adaptées euh, sur d'autres euh, euh, sous-secteurs tels que les renouvelables. Donc, euh, je crois que c'est ce qui a été euh, dit uh, grosso modo. Uh, so Michel uh, has uh, uh, um, disabled the uh, screen share. Please, can everybody come aboard with uh, on with their camera? Uh, I, I am locked in uh, as as a participant, though I'm moderating. So uh, Michel, can you tell me at your end if you can see uh, the picture of uh, the pictures of everyone? Michel. Yeah. Yes, what? I can see most of them. Yes, please. Can you help us take a screenshot? Uh, please do your best smiles. You can say cheese. cheese. If you translate that into, into fromage, it will not be the same thing. So just say cheese in English for once. Like cheese. All right. I think we are there. And uh, don't make me tell you a pretty rate. Let me know when you take the screenshot. Yeah, yes, I took it. Okay, don't say bon. Donc, uh, pour, pour partie, je voulais juste dire à certaines... Uh, 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 je voulais juste parler uh, au conditionnel. Si seulement on tirait profit de nos ressources et des avantages comparatifs qu'on a en Afrique centrale, le cobalt en RDC pour uh, les véhicules électriques, uh, la potasse, Ici au Congo, Brazzaville, pour les engrais, le bois au Gabon, euh, les noms potentiels en énergie solaire et des productions de produits euh, de l'élevage au Tchad, euh, un peu de tout au Cameroun, la Guinée équatoriale avec euh, les noms potentiels en logistique, Sao Tome et Principe, l'économie bleue, and all these other countries of ECAS in extenso. Si seulement on mettrait toutes nos forces euh, en basant sur. Euh, uh, les compétences pour uh, les, uh, la diversification économique uh, tirée par, uh, basée sur l'industrialisation et tirée par le commerce, on irait très, très, très loin d'ici fait. So, uh, je dirais que on doit le faire, on peut le faire et on va le faire. Thank you very much and see you until the ICE. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. I'd like to thank also, I mean, of course, our own speaker, 
uh, Jean-Luc there, which provided uh, the overall framework before we started the conversation. I think it was very important. Thank you very much. Uh,